Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody and a very warm welcome to this, the Sunset Safari on a blustery autumn afternoon here in the northeast corner of magnificent South Africa. We're in the Kruger National Park on a little gem of land called Juma and there's an especially warm welcome to the Glenwood Elementary School in Virginia Beach, Virginia where Mrs. Altman and Mrs. Saney's eight to nine year old classes are watching us. And for the next half an hour or 40 minutes or so, we're dedicated to you chaps. So please talk to us and ask us any questions you like about Africa, about South Africa, about the trees that you can see, about some of the birds we'll see, and hopefully some of the bigger animals that you've seen probably on TV before and that you're going to see right now with us. My name is James Hendry. And on camera today, we have got Viam. Hello, Viam. That's Viam's thumb. And for the next 40 minutes, we're going to be driving around, looking at whatever we can see. And our real focus is going to be trying to find a female leopard called Karula. She's 12 years old, and she's got two little baby cubs, which are now just about three months. So if we're very, very lucky, we'll see them. On the other vehicle is a chap called Sam, and he's being filmed by a very tall giraffe of a man called Brian. And in the final control, we've got Rebecca. Becca, and she's being helped with by Kirsten. They're the guys who are going to feed through any questions that you have. If you have any questions, ask your teachers. They will send them through. Hashtag Safari Live. If you're a viewer not in the classes of Mrs. Saney or Mrs. Altman, or questions at wildearth.tv. I'm now going to dismount this tree with a great elegance. Was that elegant, Viam? Yeah? Yes, I think it was pretty elegant, given the state of my legs. Uh, right, let me get back in the car and we'll go and explore a little adventure. Now, in case you're wondering, everybody at school, this is a completely live drive, which means that everything you're seeing now is happening at exactly the same time. And so maybe one of the things we should tell you about is, or ask you about, is why do you think that it is a different time of the day here? It's about four o'clock in the afternoon here or just after half past three, and you'll notice it's a very different time of the day where you are. And that's just a geographical, a geographical anomaly of the world. You are a lot further west than us, and so you are going to be slightly behind us. I think you're about six hours behind us at the moment. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Mrs. Altman and Mrs. Faney. Sorry, there's a couple of crackles on the radio today. Right, let's go and see what we can find. The first thing I'm going to show you is something unusual for Africa. It's a very colorful wild flower, and that's called hibiscus. And I don't know if how many of you have traveled to different parts of the United States, but you have one very famous part of the United States deep in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, which is very famous for plants like that, and that's Hawaii. And the hibiscus grows on Hawaii, not quite like that one. That is an African version of a hibiscus. But that's what we get here, and you find very similar plants in Hawaii. And you know what? You'll find lots of similar kinds of plants around here that you will find in America, what we call the equivalent. So they occupy the same kind of habitat. <laughs> Morgan, straight into it with the heavy questions. 
how fast do leopards run? Well, Morgan, leopards can probably run if they really try hard at about 45 miles per hour. So that's pretty fast. And then kilometers per hour, which is what we use out here, it's about 60 kilometers per hour. If they really, really try, they might be able to get up to about 50 miles per hour. So that's really quite fast. Much faster than a human being, and, but much slower than a cheetah, for example, which can run at probably about 60 miles an hour. Good question there. Thank you, Morgan. And Layla, you want to know what kind of animals we found? Well, not many this afternoon so far, but in this area we can see lots of different kinds of antelope, nine different kinds. There are impala, bushbuck, kudu, nyala, uh, wildebeest, um, waterbuck, lots of different kinds of those. Then we get lots of carnivores like lions and leopards and cheetahs and wild dogs and hyenas. And then we got lots of small animals like squirrels or mongoose, uh, which look like little rats, but they're not. They're like little weasels, I suppose. We get badgers and porcupines and lots of different kinds of rats and mice that live here and only here. And we also get over 250 different kinds of birds. Can you imagine 250 different kinds of birds in this little piece of land? Many butterflies. Oh, here we go. Here's a, one of our most common. There is a impala, and that's the most common kind of antelope that we get here, everyone. And Connor, while we look at that male impala, you can see he's a male because he's got horns. Remember, the horns are different from the antlers. The deer that you get in the United States have got antlers, and this ram impala has got horns which are a bit different they don't fall off every year they stay on from the time they grow and they start growing at about only about three months old Connor while we're looking at that you're interested in cheetahs and how many cubs a mama cheetah can have well apparently up to about I think sorry Hannah apparently up to about sorry I'm being attacked by flies now up to about six cubs but it's very unusual for a cheetah to have six cubs it's normally around three two or three and that's the best number for a mama cheetah to try and raise because it's very difficult for her to feed any more than two or three these guys are eating grass you can see that two males they've both got horns And I think it's Sania or Finia or Finia. I can't hear exactly what Rebecca's saying there. Um, you want to know why we've got so much sand? Sania. Well, Sania, we've got so much sand. It's actually not a, it's a very good question. We've got so much sand, and you can see, if you look forward on the road here and on each side of the road, you can see very few rocks. And the reason for that, Sania, is that this landscape is very, very old which means that for many millions of years there have been no volcanoes in this area. And that means that every year when the rains fall and then the wind blows and the sun shines, the rock that used to be here has slowly broken up into sand. And because there's been no new rock formed by big volcanoes, you know what a volcano is, so that sand has just slowly become more and more and more as the sun and the rain and the wind has done what we call weather the rock underneath here and that's why there's so much sand here let's go and, s <laughs> and <laughs> Kiara you're interested in to, to know why that flower is called hibiscus and Kiara um, as with many adults you will find that we don't know everything and I have no idea why that's called hibiscus so what I'm going to do is ask Kirsten in the final control to have a look and while she's doing that, let's head across and meet Sam. He's with Brian, and I'll see you just down the road here. Welcome to the afternoon safari with Brian and Sam out here in the bushveld. It's been a fantastic day, purely because I got to have a lion. I haven't had a good sleep in, in over a month. It's about my 15th drive here with uh, Safari Live and it's just a good day in general because we also 
won a game of rugby today, which was, <laughs> we just, we didn't think we could do it and we did it. So it's just a good day to be out here. And we are currently just following a riverbed as we carry on towards Cheetah Plains, because that's the plan for today. We want to go and explore Cheetah Plains. Brody's asking, do buffalo hurt people? Brody, they most definitely do, but it's also dependent on how you are acting and engaging with that animal. So, for example, if we saw a buffalo over there right now, you must watch the way in which it reacts with you. If it shows you aggression, if it shows you that it wants to stand its ground, it's better, Brody, to walk back and get as far away from it as possible. And that's but like particularly with the males, the big old males. Carter wants to know how do buffalo migrate? Well, Carter, they get into big social groups with the females and the youngsters that go together and they move over the plains towards the areas where there's the most food and the most water and it's quite interesting you'll have the females up in the front that will lead that that buffalo herd in that direction so that is the main reason why they'll move is in terms of water and food okay we've got to be quiet when we go down here we might see a leopard Mackenzie wants to know are there any zebras where we are there are a few zebras that are here they are quite difficult to find sometimes purely because they'll be in this thicket here to our left and they'll have these stripes. You know very well that they have black and white stripes. That coloration, those black and white stripes will often confuse predators, confuse even, well of course us, because we're also predators. So they're difficult to find but, but often you'll also find them out in the open areas with the wildebeest where they'll be grazing together. So we might just stumble upon a zebra this afternoon. Nigel is asking, what do hyenas eat? Hyenas are what we call scavengers. So they go out there and they look for any kind of carry-on, which is basically old decaying bodies that they find around here in terms of carcasses like bones and that sort of stuff. They're almost like the doctors or the hygienists of the bushveld because they go out there, clean up all the scraps that they find from old leopard kills and lion kills. Sometimes they will also take down animals when they're in big groups of them. Morgan is asking, do hyenas migrate? No, they do not migrate. They go and look for big termite mounds. And if we have an opportunity to find a termite mound, I'll show it to you. And they'll, ex ex well, it's already been excavated, which means it's been opened up by another animal and the hyenas will move into that area and create what's called a clan where the matriarch, which is the mother, looks after the clan and they will stay in that position until they raised those cubs. So there's no migrating with hyenas. Natalie, yes, there is more than one type of tree out here. You get all types of different trees. You can see over here we, we have a got the magic guari, the guari bushes. You can have a look over there to a knob thorn tree, and all these different trees will create a different environment for an, a type of bird, a type of monkey, and just create a, the opportunity for a much more diverse ecosystem. So plants are especially important for ecosystems. Wow. So we're very close to the riverine area where we can often find animals such as buffalo, elephants, kudu, nyala. And if we are super lucky this afternoon, we may just be able to see wild dogs or leopards. See over here is a watering hole, a little little bit of water that's inside this pan. This will be because a buffalo came and entered it and made it bigger and bigger and now water is able to grow or fill up that little watering hole and that watering hole will then 
give rise to much more biodiversity than just the buffalo itself. And in front of the road, you can see there's quite a lot of droppings of elephants, which is a good sign that there might be elephants in the area. So we've got to pay attention to the sound of twigs breaking. Anything like that will give us an indication to the types of animals that might be here. Andrew's asking what type of, wow, that's awesome. Brian spotted a emerald spotted pigeon. Let me go and get that. It's a wood dove. That's a beautiful bird. Look at, look at that. Look how beautiful that bird is. It is said that the call of this bird will make a similar sound to that. African green pigeon, and it makes a similar sound to that of the uh, or to Tarzan. That's how I learned it. It sounded like Tarzan in the jungle. <laughs> That's how I learned the African green pigeon. Awesome bird out here to see here. Well done, Brian. Great spot on the African green pigeon. Sitting in a dead knobthorn tree. So as we just said, we spoke about how trees will create an environment for different types of birds. That tree will also create homes for woodpeckers. Andrew's asking, what type of animal is a wildebeest? Wildebeests are normally seen as migratory animals. Their bodies will show you that they migrate far distances. But they're an animal that is an antelope, so they're actually within the antelope's kind of family group. And you can often see them on great plains of Africa. That is the black wildebeest. But here in the savannah, we see the blue wildebeest, which looks very, very similar. Once again, we're coming down into, the, into a drainage basin, and this is the best chance that we can see the secretive animals out here. So we're going to be as secretive as, as possible. Let's go and see how James is doing. There is a big hole, everybody. And that big hole used to contain something called an artfark. And an artfark, I wonder if you can all say artfark. It's an Afrikaans word and probably best said by an Afrikaans person. Viam, mm -hmm. say artfark. Uh, art there we go. That's much better. An aardvark is an ant and termite eating creature that digs big holes like this. And I'll show you a picture of him. Uh, you'll notice that he's quite similar to some of the ant eaters that you get in what we call the New World. So that's North and South America. And I'll just quickly find a picture for you. There he is there. You see, that's the aardvark there. He's also called an ant bear. And he would dig these holes and he might even live inside there. Uh, or the other thing that would live inside there, of course, are little pigs called warthogs. And I'm sure many of you have seen the Lion King. Uh, Pumba was a warthog, and he likes to live in those sorts of burrows. Right, we came into this area because it's the last place that we saw the little baby leopards. But I don't see them here anymore, so they've probably gone away with their mother. And if you look very carefully, VMP, if you wouldn't mind showing us here these tracks. There we can see some tracks on the ground there. And those tracks there are called buffalo tracks. And the buffalo will have come through this area and the leopards probably moved off when those big buffalo moved through here last night. Now, Hannah, while we get out of here, because we're in some quite thick bush here, you are interested in whether leopards are as fast as cheetahs. No, they're not. Not even close. A leopard can probably run at about 45 to 50 miles an hour, a very fast leopard maybe, and a cheetah can run at at least 60 miles per hour. So a cheetah is much faster, it's got much thinner legs, and it's much more flexible. It's like a gymnast. I'm sure you all know what gymnastics is, and the cheetah is like the gymnast of the bush. And they are very flexible, and so they're able to run very fast. Watch your heads, everybody. Duck down. And Carter, you asked the question, does a zebra have white or black stripes? Carter, a zebra has got black stripes. I think. 
Some people will tell you different, but I think a zebra has got black stripes. And Megan, Morgan, you want to know why they have stripes. Well, Morgan, it's difficult to describe unless we're actually looking at one. We will try and find some. But they've got stripes, Morgan, largely because it makes the predators unable to see exactly where they're running. So their big predators, of course, are lions. And lions like to hunt in the night time. And so when all the zebra are together and they're running around past each other like that, it becomes very confusing for their predators to see which one they should target, which one they should try and catch. And that's why we think that zebras have stripes. Some people think differently, but we're pretty sure that's why. Now, don't worry about this bush. It's going to stand up after we've gone over the top of it. Natalie, you want to know if zebras are born with stripes. Yes, they certainly are born with stripes, Natalie. Uh, they look exactly like small adults. So I think you're probably thinking about, maybe you're thinking about a horse, Natalie, like a Lipitzana, which is born black and turns white. But in the zebras, they are born stripey, and of course, they have to be born stripey because the elephants at least not the elephants, the lions like to eat them even when they're very little. All right, let's head across to Sam. I'm going to get back out onto the road and we'll head down to a water hole and see what we can find there. We have just seen some young Inyalas and their mothers running across the road here. The wind is making it very, very difficult for them. They are scared of everything because the wind makes it a lot more difficult for them out here because it just makes them a little bit more scared. They can't smell and see as much as they usually can when it's a still summer day. We're going to see if we can get another shot of those Nyalas. There we go. There's a shot of the Nyala. I've just got one. It's a different... There, there we go. I'm going to reverse a bit. That tree's in the way. There he is. So the Nyala is one of the species that are the most secretive. So what you are seeing now is a perfect example of how they are secretive. We're gonna to get to a position where we can look through the trees there. There we go. Wow, look at those Inyala. Can you see the, the big white stripes inside on, on the Inyala? Those are females and the white dots. That helps it camouflage into this environment. Layla's asking if I've seen any animals that hibernate. There are quite a few animals that hibernate out here, Layla, but I haven't seen anything at the moment. We see bats sometimes coming out, um, but, and frogs. We get a, a foam nest tree frog that we get out here sometimes that likes to, I think they aestivate, which is another type of hibernation. So there are a number of animals that hibernate out here in the bush, Layla. Look at, the, look at those ears of the, those beautiful Inyalas. Those ears will be moving around, listening to anything they can hear. Caitlin's asking, do zebra live in herds? Caitlin, yes, they do live in herds. They're what we call a dazzle of zebra. When you hear of a group of zebras, it's called a dazzle, and they move together into the open areas and they feed together. So there are big groups or herds, dazzles of zebra that we get out here. Diego just asked, are the zebra stripes hair or skin? They, it is hair, it is hair. Zebra, to be honest, I've never got Already? close enough to really touch a zebra. I'd love to touch a zebra one day yeah, and actually the feel dog, their yeah, skin and have a look the at the way in which those game. black and white oh, stripes yeah. are. Aren't they? Yeah, they're so beautiful, hey, zebra. Let's see if we can find a zebra. I'm going to do my very best to see if we can find one. We've just seen an Inyala. As we come into the open areas. Ooh. Sorry about these those comms there. All right, we're going to go see if we can find a zebra. Let's go and see how James is doing. Where? Viam has just spotted some very interesting things, everyone. Just look over there. 
to some dwarf mongoose. Remember I told you about the mongoose that we get out here? There it is. You can just see it there. Looks like a little rat. Now, the mongoose, of course, is most famous in the Rudyard Kipling story, The Jungle Book, which many of you, I think, will know because he's just, they've just made another movie about The Jungle Book. And Ricky Tiki Tavi, I don't know if you remember that one, the snake-eating mongoose. That's what that is. And then just above that, and they have a very strong friendship, though, is the mongoose. And just above where he was sitting, there's a hornbill. You see the, the hornbill there, Vian? He's just behind there. Oh, the mongoose are running everywhere now. There was a hornbill just above there. It's a special kind of bird. You see it there? Low down branch. Down? You got him. A billed hornbill or grey hornbill. Isn't he lovely? Now he has a relationship with the mongoose and they fly around with each other and the mongoose disturb things that the hornbill likes to eat. Let's leave this hanging branch which is very irritating if we're trying to film. Uh, the mongoose will disturb things like grubs and beetles and that sort of thing and the hornbill will then eat those. I'm just trying to find you. We've got some tracks here of buffaloes, a big herd of buffalo, and I want to know where they've gone. Hannah, you want to know if the mongoose can kill things bigger than them. Uh, they can because they hunt as a team. They don't hunt as one, and so one dwarf mongoose will struggle to kill things bigger than him. But if they find something they want to kill that's big, and then they will, something like a big snake uh, or even a big lizard, then they will all help each other and that's how they will kill something bigger than them. But on their own, no, they eat scorpions and that sort of thing. And Cindy, you want to know how fast a mongoose can run? Uh, I don't know exactly how fast a mongoose, oh, watch out there. I don't know how fast a mongoose can run. I would say roughly in miles per hour, probably about, shall we say, 25 miles an hour. They're pretty fast. They're much faster than us. Now remember, the fastest man in the world is Usain Bolt. And he's really, really fast. And I'm just getting some information from the final control that says a mongoose can run at 36 miles an hour. I'm willing to bet you anything you like that that dwarf mongoose is not that fast. That some of the bigger mongoose might be able to run that fast. But I don't think that a, I don't think that a little dwarf mongoose like that could run that fast. <laughs> and Caitlin, do you want to know how long I've been doing safaris? Well, this kind of safari, when I talk to you through the camera, I've only been doing for about a year. But I've been around this area, Caitlin, for about 10 years. And that's uh, 10 or 12 years. That's longer than you've been alive. So quite a long time I've been around here taking people around. And when I haven't been taking safaris, I've been working uh, on land management and looking into the conservation uh, issues around this area. We're just going to try and find you a few more animals, I hope, before the end of the drive. The buffalo tracks go off down that way. Natalie, oh, there's a pretty bird, Liam. Natalie, you've heard about wild dogs, and if you, you want to know if they're a different kind of animal or if they are just wild dogs or feral dogs, which are normal dogs that have gone wild. They are a totally different animal, Natalie. They're a very special animal, and they're like their Latin name, Lycaon pictus, means painted wolf. And a painted wolf is what they look like, and they behave very much like the wolves that you get in North America. That is called a lilac-breasted roller. One of the most beautiful birds we get here. It's got seven colors on it, if you can believe it. Seven different colors. Have a look there while you, I'm not sure how well you can see him there. You probably can't see the colors that well, but you'll have to believe me that it has seven colors. Now, Andrew, I was just saying, you're absolutely correct, that mongoose and hornbills work together. And they work together. The hornbills provide like a security service. So they fly above the mongoose and they will make a big noise if there is some kind of predator that wants to come and 
eat them, and likewise the mongoose can alarm call if they see a predator that might eat the hornbills, and then the mongoose will uh, lift up bits and pieces of sticks and stumps, and they'll expose things, grubs and scorpions and beetles, that the hornbills will eat. And so they do work as a team. They will often fly. Well, you'll see the hornbills flying along with the mongoose. And I'm just sorry, I'm struggling to hear some of the names here. Balo or Valo or... Okay, I think I've got it correct. Uh... <laughs> so lots of eagles out here, and so an eagle would definitely eat a mongoose, and even some of our... Our owls. We have a beautiful big owl here called the giant eagle owl, which sits about this tall. That tall off the dashboard. And he eats, he loves to eat mongoose. Here's another pretty flower. Let's just have a quick look at this pretty flower. And it's always a good idea to stop and look at the flowers because while they're also very beautiful to look at, it gives us a chance to listen and hear if there isn't maybe the cracking of a branch from an elephant or the um, knocking sound of buffalo banging their horns together. Pretty flower, hey? And I don't know which flower that is, you know? And Julian, you're obviously a very clever fellow because you've been on safari or you've watched safaris before. You want to know if an elephant, if I've ever seen an elephant taking down a tree. Julian, I've often seen an elephant taking down a tree, yes. They do that quite a lot, especially when we get to the dry season, when it's very dry and the animals have a tough time trying to find things to eat. Of course, oh, look at what's going on here. You see in the middle of that tree there, everybody? Look at that. And you see the hundreds and hundreds of butterflies. Let's just take out my binoculars before we go a little bit closer and let's see what they're eating. Now they're all eating flowers, everyone. They're eating the flowers of a plant called the zebra wood. Oh, that's wonderful. There are probably 10 species of butterfly there. Let's go a little bit closer. That's really special. Now remember, I know that the elephants and the buffalo and that sort of thing are the most exciting things here. But it's also the little things like this it's also very exciting. Why don't we look at these butterflies? Hannah, we want to know if a boy lion can ever lose his hair so that he looks like a f female lion. Not really. They don't lose their hair, but sometimes they're born and they don't get that hair at all. So while they don't lose their hair, they don't get a mane, what we call a mane, which is the equivalent of a human beard, I suppose. Sometimes they don't get that, and then they can be quite aggressive and nasty because they feel hard done by. This is an unbelievable scene here, everybody. There are monarch butterflies. There are those white butterflies. There are all sorts of other kinds of moths and butterflies and wasps. And we could probably spend a day looking at these special invertebrates here. Morgan, while we look at them, you want to know what a giant eagle owl is. Well, it's an owl. I don't know if you know what an owl is. I'll show you a picture of the giant eagle owl once we've had a look at those. And I have to tell you, the smell out here of these flowers is delicious. It smells like a sort of sweet jasmine mixed with a bit of rose petal and a little bit of honey tossed into that too. It's a really nice smell. I'll show you a picture now, Morgan, of a giant eagle owl. Here we go, Viampi. There we go. That's a giant eagle owl, Morgan. And you've seen, I'm sure you've seen pictures of owls before, but that's the giant eagle owl, or Verreau's eagle owl, named after a chap called Mr. Verreau. Isn't that nice? So, Morgan, you're a, <laughs> you're a budding naturalist, and you want to know which butterflies. Well, it's difficult with this camera, and without getting too much closer to be too specific, but... The orange ones that you can see are monarch butterflies. Then that sort of black and blue one in the middle is called a blue pansy. 
The white ones are called, I think, broad-bordered grass, at least broad-bordered whites. And then we've also got some moths in there. Um, I'm just trying to see one that's easy for the camera to find. Those are the main three that we've got. There are some moths at the very top there, Viam. If you go kind of on the far top right-hand side, yeah, a little bit to the right of that, yeah, in there, and a little bit right of that, yeah. Now, there is a moth in there with its wings folded. You know it's a moth and not a butterfly because it sits with its wings. Oh, no, no, I'm wrong. It was another kind of butterfly. There, are, yeah. So it's difficult for me to tell you exactly because we can't get too much closer. There are also African jokers, wasps, like I said, all sorts of different things. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right, let's move on from here. I know you don't have a very long time. So let's see if we can't find something larger. <laughs> Hannah, you want to know if a butterfly has ever landed on James or Sam? Yes, of course they have. Mostly moths, and moths actually that feed in that particular tree called burnet moths. And they are very good at landing on people because we sweat, of course, and they like the taste of salt on our skin. So you know when you're hot and you sweat and you taste your sweat, it's very salty. And that's actually got lots of nutrition for the animals out here, or the sort of the bugs out here, if you like. And so a moth will come and sit on you and drink that. And they don't harm us at all. They're very, um, they're very tickly. Oh, there's a water bucket just up ahead. We'll try and catch up. Nice antelope. And so we just leave them. If a moth lands on my arm or on my head, I just normally leave it. And it drinks its fill of sweat, and off it goes. Funny, eh? And Diego, wonderful question. Are there any types of bee here? Now, of course, bees are very important to the world. Without them, half the plants in the world would never be fertilized. And so, yes, we do get lots of bees here. Uh, mainly, we get the African honeybee. There's the... That is a very nasty waterbuck running through there. Doesn't want to be seen. You see him there, Viam? I don't know if we'll get a decent view of that beautiful big waterbuck bull. We might be able to see him through the trees here. But I don't think so. Okay, let's head across to Sam. He's got a nice big animal to show you. Have a look at all these buffalo. This is what you call a large herd. So there's actually more than just buffaloes here. There's some elephants just over there. So we've got a huge herd of buffalo here with some elephants. So this seems to be the place where all the big animals want to be at the moment. So this is going to be comprised of mainly females, mother females and young calves. The big, big males that get to the older age, the ones that are called Dagger boys, are not going to be here because they cannot keep with the herds anymore. So they will sit in other areas and that's why they are very, very dangerous to see when you are on foot. But we are extremely privileged to be sitting here with a large herd of buffalo. But have a look at this buffalo. Oh, elephants. Kiara was asking, how do we make the watering holes bigger? Or how do buffalo make the watering holes bigger? Kiara, they make them bigger because they come and sit there all the time. Can you imagine? Have a look at all these. You've just seen all these buffaloes that are here. They will be coming to this watering hole to come and get water. And when they do this, every single time, it's going to get a lot bigger because they're going to be sitting down, they're going to be moving the mud and the water is going to begin to fill up. But this, oh, we've got something going on over there. There's a big flows. I just heard that and I just saw these two buffaloes going at each other. You can't see it anymore. I'm going to reverse to see if we can get... Mackenzie's asking what does it mean if these buffaloes are swinging these tails? Their tails. They are swinging these tails, their tails, Mackenzie, because they are trying to get rid of all the flies that are around them. Can you imagine? All these flies are trying to get and lay their eggs on their bodies and, and a lot of dung that they have on them. So it gets really, really irritating. So all these buffaloes will be swinging 
their tails to get rid of the flies. But let's have a look at that baby buffalo that's just over there. Look at oh, sweet. Very, very small. So the mothers will be super protective over their youngsters. He's very, very young. He was born in the last year. Morgan's asking, how do buffaloes swim? Morgan, they don't swim. They will just walk through the watering hole. As you can see, they are doing just over here. They'll walk through the water. They don't have the ability to swim. They just like to get into the water, get a mud bath, and that'll help them with the flies and ticks a bit later. If they can cover themselves in a good layer of dust and dirt, it'll protect them in the future as they go and look and graze for good grasses. We are so lucky to be sitting with this huge herd of buffalo. And we... Miriam, Jeff, do buffalo get along with other species? Miriam, yeah? Miriam, yeah, is asking, do buffaloes get along with the other species? Yes, it's dependent on which species it, species it is. Buffalo will often go out into the open areas and because they are not predators, they'll just be grazing. It is okay for other species like the wildebeest and the, and the zebra to be in the same location as the buffalo. But when it comes to a lion and a leopard, it's a lot more difficult. Xavier is asking, are buffaloes related to hippos? No, they are from a completely different family the buffaloes and the hippos, but let's have a look at this ele elephant that is... Oh, we can't reach the elephant. We'll see if we can get... Oh, let's go and see what James is up to. I think he's got a great surprise for you. We're going to see if we can get a good shot of those elephants. Are you joking? Come quickly. Sorry, everybody, uh, I couldn't hear the radio there. There's a beautiful leopard and her little babies just behind her. This is Karula, everybody, the queen of Juma. And there's little babies that we were hoping to find. We just drove down this road and there they are. And they're a little bit scared of the vehicle, so we're not going to move. And she's going to help them to come past the car. We just don't, we can't go, you can see the left-hand side of your picture, we can't go left of that. Now I'm going to be, just start to whisper. She's going to bring them right past us, everybody. This is so very special. We never see this kind of thing, or hardly ever. And this is a very special leopardess. And she's very kindly bringing her cubs to see us and to see you all the way in the United States. She's calling them now. She's going, psh, 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 psh calling them and they're coming through the bush they're a little bit nervous of us and that's why they won't walk on the road she's coming very close to us now you'll see the car look how close she is she's going to look at Viam now see she looks at Viam and she's calling that's a tutu, 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 tutu. we're going to wait right here we're not going to move because the little ones are going to be too scared if we start the car but they're coming through the bush to the side of us now. Their mother is walking behind us, but we're not going to worry about her. Let's just see if we can't see these special little things as they come through the bush. You see them, Bill? I can hear them. We're just going to wait here. There she is, everybody. The cubs, Andrew, get scared of the jeep just because they don't know what it is. You can see that she is familiar with the jeep, and so she doesn't worry too much about what it is. But for the little ones, they get very nervous because they don't know what it is. Oh, she's something. She might want to. She may have spotted something she wants to kill. She spotted something she wants to kill. I'm not going to move the car. Here comes the little one. Just running through there. There we go. Here comes the other one. This is so special. You can hear them maybe calling, and I think this is too wonderful. I don't want to start the car just yet, everyone. I'm going to let them catch up with their mother first so that they will feel safe around her. There, they've just gone in there. Okay, we can start and reverse back a little bit. 
We can't follow them into this particular property. All right, everybody, we're going to say goodbye to you as you watch this very, very special thing. Isn't this just too special for words? Have a wonderful day in America, and I'm so pleased that you got this very special treat from Karula, the Queen of Juma. We'll see you next time. Stations, Karula is mobile towards Twin Dams on Gari, Maine, with the two youngsters. Everybody, is this not the most magnificent thing? Now I've got the animals. This is just incredible. I'm going to drive very slowly. I don't want those little ones to get a fright. So we're going to keep it at a distance like this. I'm sure that's a little male running across. And please excuse the slightly jumpy picture, everyone. It's because we're going to have to zoom all the way in. And you can see that little one's just a bit nervous. Stations, I have the animals. I have the animals, not the tracks. I have the animals here, the animals, not the tracks. Tex and Ephraim, I've got the animals, not the tracks, the animals. Look at that. Oh my goodness. Let's just stop here a little bit. So like I was saying, I just want, I was just quickly trying to tell Texan and Ephraim because if they go, the, if they go to the right hand side, we're not going to be able to follow them. That's onto Little Gari. Guys, if you're interested, it looks like she might go south. Um, so yeah, please make your way if you want to come and look. And Leo Pad, you want to know how long before they're habituated? Well, Leo Pad, they'll be coming, they'll become habituated, I suppose within the next month or so, you know, we are able to view them very comfortably from about five or six months. And what is so special about this is, well, not, not so, so special, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here, I'm becoming so excited. Well, she's going south. If she's going south into Little Gari, we'll just slowly roll down here and then we can talk a little bit more. There they go. You still see them, yeah? There she is. There she goes through there. I can't believe we've been so lucky, everybody. We turned onto this road and there they were. So, Leopad, I would imagine that in the space of about, when they're about four months old, they'll be very comfortable around us without her, probably. But at this stage, which is quite nice, I'm quite happy that they're not that relaxed around us, because it means that they haven't had that much experience of vehicles by this stage, and I think that's quite a nice thing. I can just see her tail just moving through there. AJ Mirabel, you say you reckon Karula's got a crush on me. I hope she does, bringing her cubs out to see me every single time. It's so magnificently special. We're going to move out of the sighting so that we can give Ephraim a chance to see them. yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to help these guys. If I'm a so, if I'm a so, yeah, so. Now that's tax, everybody. We're just going to let him hopefully get a view, and then we'll move out. Wasn't that just unbelievable?
I'm just going to move up here so that these guys can. The dad is, and yes, there we go, you've got them. There she is. I'm just going to wait here just so that I can help Ephraim. Ef, come quickly back. We, we're not, we're going to leave the sighting now, everybody, because we only want two vehicles in there. And so we're just going to wait here and just help tax on an Ephraim. Ephraim, we've got visual here. Ephraim, come back. No, he's not hearing me, poor fellow. Ephraim, Ephraim again. There we go. I think he's heard tax. F, F, hit the one. Enjoy. Okay, everybody, we're going to leave the sighting now. We're just going to let them uh, be with the two leopards. We think the father is Tingana. We're pretty sure the father is Tingana. Um, she mated with him at least, I think it was four or five times before she conceived and produced those <laughs> great wondrous bundles of fluff golden spots and joy. Wow. <laughs> Liam? Uh, probably deserve another fist pump, eh? There we go. Nothing to do with our skill, all to do with Karula's very kind ways in showing us her little babies. Really not hard to track down a buffalo herd as you ask in the joy of those three leopards. So I think we are looking at one male there and probably a female. You can see there's some fairly inclement weather coming in. I think it's the end of that front that was sort of sitting over us this morning. And we've had a few spots of rain, but nothing huge. And those, those little ones, I suppose, are probably a little more under threat in weather like this because it's difficult for them to hear what's coming through the bush. And I suspect maybe that's why she's moved them. Or, actually more likely, that she's killed something else inside here, hung it in a tree, and she's waiting for them. At least she's taking them there. Oh, good idea. And James Richard, you say, can we look at their teeny tiny little tracks? Yes, let's go and do that. In fact, I'd really like to do that, largely because I'm not sure that I'm differentiating their tracks from those of a civet. Where were we about here? Yes, here we go. Here they are. There are her teeny tiny little tracks. Okay, let me... Let me move back a bit. Okay, you won't, the light's not ideal. Let me get out of the car quickly and I'll show them to you. They're actually bigger than I thought they were. They're bigger than a civet's tracks and probably much like a, um, like a domestic cat or a domestic dog, their feet are larger than you'd think they'd be when they're this little. Um, here's a good one. Now this is, she's put, audio. she's put both, if I shout at this volume, you can hear me, can you? She's put both her back and front foot on top of each other, well the cub has, and that's the size. So roughly an inch long. That's much bigger than I thought it would be. And I guess the same again wide. That is quite sort of thick sand, and so the tracks will be, uh, I guess, bigger than they would be in mud. So bigger than a house cat already, definitely, and bigger than a civet's. And I'll just try and find the mother's tracks too, because they're here and they're obviously different. Mother's tracks about twice the size. I'll, we'll try and find some obvious mum tracks. Very cool. <laughs> wow. I've just got to plug myself in. That's why I look like I'm scratching my back. All right, I'm back in. Yeah. 
There's the mother's track. Can you see that one, Liam? Am I too close? I mean, just try and get into a position where you can see the track. Sorry. It's almost impossible. <laughs> How's that? You see those? There we go. There's the mum's tracks there. Uh, very distinct. And they're probably, yeah, about one and a half to two inches long. You can actually see the little one. No, you can't. Cool. Very nice. Tim, you had a question. Sorry, I've missed what it was exactly. I'm going to ask for it again. Oh, what language am I speaking to the other guides? I'm speaking a language called Shitsonga or Shangan. I'm sure she's taking them to another kill. <laughs> and it's a language that's spoken, it's, very, uh, it's actually not a commonly spoken language in this country, but in this area, in the Lowfelt, uh, and it goes down into Mozambique, it's very commonly spoken. And of course, it's interesting because the borders that exist between African countries were drawn not by Africans, but by European colonists. And so they split whole groups of people apart by, you know, people, I think it was a conference in Belgium in 1896. And they basically just drew lines across a map uh, with total disregard for any kind of, uh, you know, tribal boundaries. And so with the result that we have a small group of Shangans or Tsongas in this country, and lots and lots of them in Mozambique to the east of us. try and get my heart rate down. <laughs> Tim, uh, while we're looking at those tracks, you're interested in whether or not we can tell individual tracks um, and what age they are and what age the animals are. Tim, we can pretty much. I can see that the female's tracks have come up here. She's fetched those cubs and she's taking them down there. That means only one thing, that she's got another kill there, which is fantastic for her. I'm just a little irritated that I think she's probably stashed it somewhere south of our boundary. Tim, if you are in an area some people will say, well, I can see that's the tracks of a specific leopard. It's not particularly hard in this area because they are territorial, which means if you see the tracks of a female leopard in a specific area, you can pretty much be sure who it is. But can you tell if they were in a certain area, if they were, you know, their tracks were overlapping? Not unless there was a substantial size difference, no, then you couldn't tell the difference. Some people will tell you, you can't tell you they can. Um, I'm always a little bit... Um, suspicious of those sorts of claims. An elephant you can sometimes because they have a unique sort of fingerprint on the bottom or footprint if you like on the bottom of their feet so you could definitely tell with an elephant but with an individual leopard other than for the fact that they are in the same place or the same territory I think it would be quite difficult. These things came all the way down this road. While we were knocking about up there they were walking straight down the road here totally un hindered by cars, we could have viewed them for much longer. And I will find out from tax if they, if they stay or if they go back onto Juma. But I think she's probably killed and left them in the side. Great stuff. All right, we'll move on and see what else we can find. And of course, many of you know that we contribute to the research that goes on with Panthera. Panthera is an, an NGO. She came out here with the cubs. Panthera is an NGO that looks after or does a lot of research into, um, into endangered cats and especially large cats from the genus Panthera. And we collect a lot of the, well, not a lot, but we've been collecting feces samples of all the leopards here so that they can do various bits and pieces of research on them. And Valerie, you want to know if we would take the feces of the youngsters at this stage? Well, absolutely, if we could get it, we would certainly do that. But I think it'd be quite difficult. And I also think, given that they're still suckling, it would be fairly liquid and so fairly difficult 
to collect. So we might wait a little while, but if we could find some, then we definitely will. Let's go across to Sam. I'm going to bask for a little while in happiness. So we have just been with a huge buffalo herd that has just walked and they're going towards Torchwood now, towards our southern and eastern boundary and we are with a little terrapin that seems to have been very, very frightened from that experience of the buffalo herd. There we go, you can just see his head coming out there and his shells there. So the terrapin thinks that we can't see him but we can really have a good look at him like this. And so my feeling is that this terrapin is frightened. He was moving at a very, very quick pace down this road. And what we're going to do now is, is move in this direction, see if we can get towards that big buffalo herd and watch them come past the vehicle again. It was incredible just watching them in the water. There were so many of them. There must have been over a hundred. What would you say, Brian? Yeah, definitely. definitely over 100. And the rain is starting to come through, so it's a very, very interesting afternoon. We've got our rain covers out, we've got buffaloes walking, and we're going to see if we can find them again. It's not going to be very difficult to find them purely because they make quite a noise as they walk through the bush. Debbie McKesson is saying that James has my elephant. Yes, Debbie, you know, they actually made a, a note. Uh, both Brian and um, James were talking about my elephant, and I didn't quite understand what they were talking about just before the start of drive. And they, were, you know, they didn't say Mr. Ellie, they talked about him as a token. So I wasn't sure what they were talking about, and then I just totally forgot that my Ellie was no longer on my car. So for the first few seconds, I was shocked and scared. I didn't know what to do, now that I didn't have Mr. Ellie on the car. <laughs> but then it was fine, because I realized it's going to bring James a lot of luck. And did it bring James luck? I think so. You have been sitting with some wonderful, beautiful leopard cubs, which I'm still very, very keen to see. So when I get the opportunity to see those leopard cubs, I'm going to put that elephant on my car and go and look for them. So he seems to bring a lot of luck. I mean, we were, myself and Brian were at Arethusa yesterday, and just to be quite honest with you, there were times when I didn't know where I was going. But that small little elephant gave me the strength to move forward and turn left and then turn right. It was nice to have a little, small little carving of an elephant. Thera is asking, are there any baobab trees here in the Kruger? Yes, there are. There are quite a few baobab trees, but there are not any here in the location that we are at at the moment. They're mainly inside that big, big national park of the Kruger. And we're still connected to the Kruger National Park. Our, our land is, is privately owned, which is Sabi Sands, and it's 60,000 hectares big, and it's open to the greater Kruger Park, which is also open to the Gonorrhoe Zoo National Park, which is, I think it's in Mozambique. So if you have a, if you look it up, you'll see it as the Greater Limpopo Trans Frontier Park. I think it's the greatest area of wilderness in the world. So we're very, very lucky to be driving around these areas. I'm just trying to see if we can hear these buffaloes. They are still quite you know, to the east of us, and we're going to drive around and catch them. Cassie is asking, Sam, have you ever been to the United States, and what is your favorite animal here? So I'm presuming here is in the United States. Um, I've never been to the United States. I've been to, to the, the Caribbean islands, um, which is as close as, I, you know, as close as I can get to the United States. 
And what is my favorite animal there? Well, I also love the marine. My, I love being in the water. And so, you know, I don't know the ecology of, of America at all, or even the watering areas, but just swimming around the Caribbean and, and looking at all those tropical fish was something that I truly, truly enjoyed. But I'm hoping to one day get to America, go to the Yellowstone National Park, which I did part of my master's on research is you know, how those wolves influence that landscape. And I just really, really want to go and see it. Really, really, truly do. Hopefully one day, Cassie, I'll make my way to America and I can go and see all the beautiful diversity of animals and creatures that live there. Okay, so the buffaloes are going to be up there. Let's see. We... Tim's asking, is the end of May a good time to visit the Sabi Sands? You know, I think it is a good time to visit the Sabi Sands purely because it's coming out of autumn or the, either the middle of autumn or the end of autumn, and that is so beautiful in terms of the types of leaf, what the coloration of the leaves are yellowish orange and it just brings a very 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 different mood to the Sabi sands but what's even more interesting is that it creates a landscape that's able to see through we're able to see through the trees uh, because there's not as many leaves so the chances for us as safari guides to be able to find wilderness and animals within the wilderness is much greater so I think May June is a fantastic time to make it to this area but if you are you are if you're in love with birds I would say come in November December because that is when you'll get the greatest diversity of bird life here and get over 300 species of birds if you come through in November or December Oh, so you can really feel the pressure has changed. Just look, look above us. Look at these clouds that are growing. We've had to put our rain covers on on the car because it's going to get quite wet out there if we're not careful. And I'll tell you what, any rain that pours today will be very, very well received by the Sabi Sands. We're in a great need for some rain in this area, even though it looks very green. I think it was Lee Tag. Lee Tag was asking which lodges did I work before this. You know, I didn't. I trained at Londolosi Game Reserve, which is just south of here, about 40, 20 kilometers south of here. And I spent around seven months there. So that's the only training that I've done in the bush. My only bush time is at Londolosi for seven months. And other than that, I've just been living in Brazil and living in the Cedarberg Mountains, which is just north of Cape Town. Incredible wilderness that is home to the Cape Leopard and to the Caracal and I worked for the Cape Leopard Trust there, and it was amazing. So this is, I haven't even spent a full year. Oh. Oh, so Cassie in Florida was, asked, was saying, no, I want to know what your favorite animal is here in this, this ecology. Well, Cassie, it's very difficult because I'm, I'm fascinated by both things that are small and big. I mean, yesterday I sat with a, a dice moth and it was incredible. It was, I don't know if it was anyone was with me there, but we saw this dice moth that had all these long antennas on it, which helped it move in a direction. So it was just not a dice moth, it was the dice caterpillar. So I thought that was incredible. But if I think about something that I love, it's without a doubt a, car a caracal, purely because I've never seen a caracal. And but I'm just in love with the features that I've seen in books and I, I often dream about the caracal and I really want to see the caracal. So we're going to drive in this direction and hopefully the buffaloes are going to be coming in the, this way. If they're not, we're going to go up to Cheetah Cut Line 
and see if we can find them down there and we might just have the greatest view of buffaloes moving across the car. While we do that, let's go and see how Mr. James Hendry is doing. Let's just have a quick look at the sky there, everybody. I know VM is not a huge sky filmer, but like you like the clouds. Okay, good. And also, as we've shown VM a leopard, everyone, he will film for us the clouds. Thank you, VM. Look how pretty the sun rays coming out. And of course, now trying to find something to take a photograph of that with, some form of device which I think will be very pretty indeed. I'm a wonderful photographer, VM. Did you know that? There we go. I'll now run it through one of these incredible apps which will make it look like it was taken by somebody with a much more expensive camera. Unless you look carefully, in which case it will look precisely what it is. Ah, Martin in New York, you ask a very valid question for which I'm afraid you've now opened yourself up for an, a lesson from me uh, which will be delivered through the medium of my horrific art. I'm going to draw you a map, Martin, of precisely where the Great Migration is and I'll show you why it doesn't come down here. Now for those of you who don't know, the Great Migration takes place in Tanzania and Kenya there is a migrating... A migrating uh, impala ram. I'm just going to find a nice piece of sand where I'm able to uh, draw for you. I'm going to draw you a nice picture of Africa and I'll show you where the Great Migration happens and where we are. But we're basically separated by uh, two countries between where the Great Migration happens and when we, where we are. And so we don't have that many wildebeest here. There's probably a herd of only of about 25 on this reserve and another one of similar size on Arethusa. That's perfectly normal uh, because they like the more open areas. They don't necessarily like this sort of broad-leafed woodland here. Ah, so she did, she's caught, an, she caught a big adult impala male. That's wonderful news. Okay, I'm just going to quickly get an, an update from Ephraim. Just getting an update. I'm afraid not, not visible from the road, I don't think. If confirm it's visible from the road or not. Okay, copy. No, it's not visible from the road. Okay. Right. Martin, I apologize in advance for my art, but I think it's important that I practice and subject you to my art every so often. Viam, you must be very happy about this. Are you looking forward to it? I'm so excited. I bet you are. Now, the last time I did this with VM, I drew a horrific, hor it was probably my worst attempt ever. Anyway, this is how it's going to go. I won't be on communications with the final control, uh, but VM will feed me any relevant information. Here is my pen, or stylus. All right, VM, uh, this uh, was the top of the map over here, is that all right? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Right, that will be south, everyone. Just pick up your belt back. Breaking up. Oh, you're picking this up. Put it in your top pocket. Do you copy me now? Is that better? Perfect. Okay, here is the top of the map, north. Now, what I will draw is, first of all, Africa badly. So, we go down like that to the Horn of Africa there and we come all the way down here to South Africa, around here is the Cape, 
go up around the big bulge, around like that. There's a bit of a gap there. That's basically Africa. Can you see that, everybody? Liam, is that okay? Vaguely seeable? Sort of. Okay, well, that's Africa. South Africa is in this region here. That's pretty much South Africa. And we've got Tanzania and Kenya up here. I'm just going to draw you the general region where they are. Okay, and the Wildermeer's migration takes place in the Masai Mara and Serengeti ecosystems. So if I just draw a line like that, basically between those two countries, between Kenya and largely into Tanzania. So you can see here that there's an enormous gap between us and the Great Migration. And animals can't come across that far. I don't think they ever did. Um, this is a slightly different species of wildebeest here. This one is called the blue wildebeest, and the one up there is called the brindled gnu. Anyway, if we focus in on this little section here, this is South Africa, and Mozambique is there, and we're in this section of South Africa here, and that's called the Kruger National Park, and the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park extends into Mozambique there and into Zimbabwe there, and there are no fences between any of this area. It's 8 million acres of contiguous wildlife land, and we're on a little section over there called the Sabi Sands, and within the Sabi Sands, Juma, Arethusa to our west, and Cheetah Plains to our east. And if you ever come to South Africa, you need to come here. You possibly need to go to Cape Town, and uh, Viam just had his holiday over here in this Kalahari, or the Kalahari. Okay. Anyway, that's better than my last attempt, don't you think? Mm. You're not going to sell it, though. You still, you still, no, we can't sell it. No, no, I will, I'll, I'll agree with that. Mm. Selling that would not fetch a great deal of money. It'll probably be better if the wind just blows it away. If, yes, it will be better if the wind just blows it away. Uh, I think the wind probably will just blow it away. Good. On we go. <laughs> now, we have not seen... Right, okay, let's go across to Sam and find out what's going on there. Um, apparently I've lost something. We'll see you later. So the clouds are looking dark and thick and very, very ominous in the sense that it looks like it might just rain in just a few minutes. But look at the sun that's shining out of there. It's just incredible. I don't think that the sun will burn through that cloud this afternoon. We might just be in for a little bit of rain, which would be great. We've got our rain covers, so we're ready for anything that might happen out there this afternoon. Look at those colors, incredible. Look at that yellow and that white and even that shine. Even that shine that's coming out of the clouds there. If you want to screenshot that picturesque, look of the Sabi sands this afternoon but we are also tracking a leopard at the same time so while the sunset begins to give us great visual we're gonna see if we can find a leopard so we were just driving on the road looking to see if we could find the buffalo herd the buffalo herd was moving in that direction and then we just came across these tracks and myself and Brian thought you know, it would be quite a fantastic afternoon if not only you saw two leopard cubs, but you also managed to see another leopard. It could very well be Mvula or Kachima, I think the name was, Kachima. And we've, a lot of people have been asking what leopard that was the other day. And I just wanted to let you know that I'm really not sure which leopard it was. It was either Mvula or Kachima. I think that that's the way in which you pronounce it and I'm going to do my best to try and get it, take that picture and send it to the other lodge to see if we can locate. But the problem was that we never saw the front end. Survey94 is asking, why do we not see why do we not see any baboons or monkeys while we're here at this part of Juma? Well, Survey 94, 
we saw baboons literally just down the road here about two days ago. It was a very, very quick sighting. They came running out of the bushes. They jumped in front of our road and next thing they were gone. So we definitely do see um, baboons and monkeys around here. It's just, I think, a lot more thicker. So it's difficult to find them and it's not as safe. And what they often do is sit up in trees. So I've only been here for about a month. Hopefully I'll be able to work this area a bit more and see if we can find more buff uh, well not buffaloes. <laughs> it was a huge, large herd of buffaloes, but some monkeys and some baboons. So we are looking for a leopard and the tracks headed off in that direction. So we're gonna see if we can listen out for any sounds that could be here from bird call alarms to even monkey alarm calls to a squirrel alarm call. And that'll give us, ooh, I think I see a buffalo over there. This might very well be, oh, we are in luck, everyone. The large herd, we have found the large herd. There's one, two, there. I see them here. Potentially, if we just sit in a nice position, we'll have them walk around. Carl from Durban was asking, you know, saying I'm very similar to his age, and did I ever hear about a story of Kilinzu? The baby buffalo? I haven't actually heard that story of the baby buffalo. I've, yeah, sorry, Carl. I, I'm not sure what what uh, what story that is. I'll, I'll find out. I'll see if I can look up that story, and I'm going to Google it straight away when I get back and see if I can read up on that baby buffalo, learn a little bit more. Look at that. There we go. Clearly, a female that we're looking at. A female has a much smaller boss than the male. And it's also in the herd. So the herds will comprise of both older females and youngsters. So hopefully we can get a shot. Oh, wow, the buffaloes are now coming towards us. There's three that are just in the road in front of, in front of us. This could be a great sighting. As soon as they get closer, I'm going to try and speak a little bit softly because I know, oh, there's a youngster. Have a look at that youngster. Can't be more than one year old. Would have been born probably around November, December. And you'll find that this calf will do its best to stick with its mother because at this age, very, very vulnerable position purely because they could be eaten by wild dogs or leopards or lions. Sometimes the young buffaloes will go and hide in the thicket when there is something going on in terms of being chased by lions or something and it can become a very easy kill for a leopard that is slowly walking around the bush vault when the chaos is going on. But have a listen to this. The youngster's about to come through. Hello. Welcome. Say hello to Safari Live. You can just see a snout through the grasses there. <laughs> there we go, you see, trying to get as close to his mother. Ooh. There we go. I'm not leaving you, Mom. I'm sticking by your side. She's curious. She's having a look at us. Or he. Not sure of the gender of this youngster. But you can see that they walk, they, as they're walking, they are grazing on all the grasses. So this was the same herd, large herd that we saw at Buffer's Hook Dam. It was incredible to watch them all go through the water and 
come out the other side. And so, what's inter interesting is to learn about, well, have a look at that boss. And both the female and the male has these bosses. Oh, there's a fight going on there. Sorry, just quickly saw that. While we sit here with these buffaloes, let's go to James and the rain. Look there, everybody. There be some rain, some autumn rain falling down. Um, I don't think it's going to come here, but we never know. It might come here. It's not impossible that it should arrive here. But as you can see, as with most of the rain this year, it's very localized. It's not a sort of big wall of water falling onto the, onto the earth. It's a kind of very thin curtain. And that's been the case for most of the year. So very little has sort of dumped or very few storms have dumped properly over the whole low felt just that kind of localized storm and then if we go a little bit further to the south of that you can see where the sun's going to come down to the west and just some spectacular rays and clouds here if only i were a painter i would be able to capture this there we go very nice vm now, I think this is just a little cameo. We'll go back to the buffalo now. I just want to quickly show you, of course, the elephant that Sam left on the vehicle, which I am now holding hostage. So if he doesn't behave himself, I shall push him off, you see. Anyway, let's go back across to Sam and his buffalo. We'll see you, hopefully, with some hyenas a bit later. So I heard that um, James was poking my elephant. James, James, James. That elephant has only brought him good luck today. Now he's poking it. Come on, James. <laughs> it's okay, you can poke, poke Mr. Elephant. He might just wake up one day and not have that elephant on his car. Lee Pad was asking, what makes me think that the buffaloes were not born in December? Well, sorry, not born. What makes me think that they were born in December? There is a warthog. Oh, a massive, massive, massive pig. You see it there? Oh, man, I parked you behind a tree again. Sorry. Oh, there he is. That is the fattest pig I've ever seen out here. Hey? The yeah, he's a giant. This is a seriously, seriously impressive pig, that. Anyway, he's in some big thickets. We're now heading up the western boundary of Juma. We went into Arethusa this morning. There wasn't a great deal going on. And so Viam said he'd like to go and find Gajima, the new male leopard, on the Biffles or Cut line. So I said, OK, let's find, let's go and do that. So that's what we're going to do. And we'll turn in at the hyena den at some stage as well. We went into the sort of larger den yesterday evening and nothing was going on. And then Tax came out of Biffles and went to the smaller den and that was active, so I'm hoping that we'll get to spend a bit of time with our hyena friends today. We live in hope. And all around here is that lovely, lovely smelling plant whose name I have since forgotten. Brent did tell it to me. I will try and find it. Donna, you say I need to be nice to this elephant because it brought me cat luck today. Donna, I absolutely agree with you. I shall be very kind to this elephant. There are some long-tailed shrikes. 
in that thorny bushel that has been pushed over by elephants. There's also something else there. Let me just look with these powerful binoculars. It's a flycatcher. Probably a dusky flycatcher. Um, on the yep, on the far right hand side of your screen there, you can just see it there. Trying to look magnificent, but when faced with the gorgeousness of the long-tailed trike, it has flown off in embarrassment to be brown and drab somewhere else. I was just saying around here, it smells so wonderful. It smells sort of like um, I don't know what it smells like. It smells sort of like a, a gentle chocolatey smell. Can you smell that? And it's a plant that Brent showed me the other day. And I can't actually see it around here. And its name I have since forgotten. But it grows in these clearings. And it smells... Oh, there it is. Wait, there it is. Wait, there it is. There it is. <coughs> now, again, you will have to excuse the way I'm moving. Uh, we did play an extensively long game of touch rugby today with uh, some very competitive people from Johannesburg. They were extremely competitive. We played for an hour and a half. And um, you will see Sam will also be probably in something of a state. It's not this. It's got a purple flower. And it's the leaf that smells. And I, I've said this to you before, the only time I've ever smelt this before was in Cornwall in England, when I was running through the sort of the, the hedgerows. Oh, it's quite strong here. No. No. We'll give up now, everyone, don't worry. I don't expect you to sit and watch me do this all afternoon. No. <laughs> it's just so lovely. It's not that one either. Anyway, makes me feel very comforted when I smell it. Um, why didn't you play touch rugby with us today? I was busy. You were busy. I wish I'd been busy. <laughs> Sam, by the way, was not attacked by Buffalo. He broke his car. So, unfortunately, he is offline. I'm being very nasty to him. He didn't break it. I suspect it was giving us trouble this morning as well. And I suspect what's happened is that the aerial cable has snapped again. We lost signal once or twice today in Rusty. And I think that's what's happened. Anyway, we will, you will be with me for the next little while. He's rushing back towards the Democratic Republic of the Congo to have his aerial fixed, to have the... Inimitable Connor, have a look at it, and his mate, Eugene. We've got both of them on site now. And for those of you who don't know, obviously an operation like this just doesn't, doesn't occur without an extensive technical team with a, a suite of knowledge that spans mechanical engineering, electronic engineering, radio engineering, chemical engineering in one case, and uh, it's really difficult uh, to f a, find people who are, have the suite of skills we need and B, who are then prepared to live out here in the bush because a lot of people who like working in, in engineering are not really bush people. Anyway, so we're very lucky to have both Eugene and Connor at the moment and, of course, Alex Wozniewski, the Russian, who has unfortunately gone back to Russia to spend a bit of time there with his family. I'm unable to speak about or to Alex without trying to put on a Russian accent. Now, Zach, you want to know about the rarer big cats in Africa. What are some of the most, or the rarer ones that we find here? 
Well, Zach, the leopard is, uh, well, not rare, but it's, it's unusual to see, but it is fairly widespread. I suppose the cheetah would be one of the rarer ones. Lions are under threat, as we know. Probably fewer than 20,000 of them left on the entire continent, which is sad. Um, but of the big cats, I mean, those are the three iconic cats that we get out here. And we don't really find any other big cats here. But there are lots and lots of smaller cats. And I suppose the black-footed cat of the Kalahari and the other desert regions would be a very rare one. There's a golden cat, I think, which you get up um, towards the Horn of Africa. That's pretty rare. Uh, what else would constitute a rare cat? I mean, serval that we find here, they're pretty rare, but they're not big cats. The, the biggest ones, the lion, the cheetah, and the leopard, are, well, they're all threatened, make no mistake. But rarer than that is in terms of big cats we don't get. Hello, Jared. Um, <laughs> do you want to know what would happen if a hyena cub came across a leopard cub? What would happen? I'm not laughing because of your question. I'm laughing because so many people add an extra H to the word hyena. And, of course, it doesn't exist there. Thank you, Rebecca. You started laughing as well. She did. Um, Jared, I, it depends how old they were, I guess. Let's say they were both sort of three months, like those little leopard cubs. Uh, what would happen there? Um, yeah, I, I don't really know. I, I can't really imagine a scenario where they would meet each other. But I suspect quite strongly that the hyena cubs, you know that they're born with teeth, so I mean they're quite vicious. And they do engage in siblicide relatively often. In other words, they kill their siblings. So I mean, I think they're quite vicious from the beginning. And so I wouldn't give the hyena, at least the leopard cub, too much chance. I think if you raised them both in captivity, they'd probably get on famously until they became adults. Impala males. <laughs> and Leslie, no, the, your question is, will this Watch this male here. Watch him. Look at his neck. Look how he's puffed up. Leslie, while we watch this male, know the arrangement with the cubs is very different. You want to know if the male might kill the female or vice versa. No, they won't kill each other. They won't harm each other at all. They will be very friendly playmates until they are at least sort of two years old maybe even three years old. Lovely little herd of impala, and they're being dominated by that one male. He's now chasing them, and trying to make sure that they stay within his little territory. Now, this sort of behavior has been, I think, very subdued this year. Everybody's on edge because they don't want to be in trouble with the big male. Not so much that. I always get the impression that the females are looking at him going, oh, would he just stop? Why doesn't he leave us alone? Like they feel he's a bit of an oaf, which I suppose is exactly how female humans feel about men who posture like a male impala does. Rebecca says, yes, that's exactly how female humans feel about men who posture. <laughs> All right, on that note, let's carry on. Uh, somebody has been into the hyena den and apparently it is active, so let's go have a look there. Lee Pad, you say you're going to be at Juma for four nights uh, this next week. And could you get my autograph? Uh, well, I suppose you could, yes. Um, 
Yes, let us know when you get here, and I shall come around and sign something for you. It will immediately render whatever I sign totally worthless, but I will happily do that for you. As will Vim. Vim, would you like to sign an autograph, or do you, are you you're too private for that? Vim? I can't write. You can't write. Vim says he's illiterate. Now, we'd happily do that for you. Lee Pad, that's great news that you're coming out here. I think it'll be, you'll have a good time. It's a lovely time of the year. And Gilly from Wisconsin, you want to know if I've considered making plaster casts of the tracks. Uh, I have, to some extent, but Gilly, it doesn't. You said it'd be great for Big Cat Week. Yeah, it would. Um, if you, you, we could do it, I suppose. I Brent bought a whole lot of plaster of Paris the other day. I'm not sure what's happened to it. Um, he may have eaten it by this stage. But unless the tracks are in some kind of a, what you need is is mud. You go into hard mud, and then it kind of needs to harden properly, and then you can pour the plaster of Paris in and pull them out, and you make some great tracks like that. I find that in the sand, because the sand is not firm, as soon as you pour the plaster of Paris into it, uh, the tracks kind of, they lose their shape and they don't look so good. But yes, it is certainly something we could try and do. I shall try and follow up with Brent Leo Smith and find out what happened to the plaster of Paris that he bought. What have you got there, Vim? Going which way? Yes. I think we've, we had him about two days, a day or two ago. Does that look quite fresh? Not a okay. All right, well, let's have a... Well, Viam said that he uh, saw some lion tracks going along this road. We did have the Birminghams around here a couple of days ago, but it might not be them. It might be... I'll say this advisedly, everybody. If there's only one male walking around these parts, then it could be young Junior of the Inkahumas. There's some hyena tracks going the other way, which I thought be, might, might be male leopards. No, not. I remember young Junior has been seen back in these parts over the last little while, and Junior, for anybody who doesn't know, is now approaching his fourth birthday, as far as I'm aware. He was born into the Inkahuma pride, and uh, oh, zebras. You want to look at them, do you? <laughs> Viam subtly pointed at the zebras and a look in his eye said, You idiot, did you not spot these? The answer was no, I didn't. Sorry, Viam. And there, we, I'm sad we didn't have these with the school drive because those kids would have loved to see the zebras. And we had a very astute question about them. Why do they have stripes? And if you watch them walking through the bushes now, look how that striping plays tricks with your eyes. They've got a friend, Viam. <laughs> and he is lurking with them because it's just safer to be around other animals when you're in the wind like this. <laughs> they are very nasty to each other. <laughs> the wildebeest completely disinterested just walking around with them kind of tolerating them but you see how their, their stripes do play tricks with your eyes slightly as they walk through the woodland and I think that if you're a nocturnal predator hunting at night well that's probably quite difficult to pick out you know the details quite difficult to see especially if they're running at top speed Very nice, thank you, Vian. Sorry, I missed them. <laughs> it's an incredulous look. Fair enough. Fair enough, it was. Fair enough. I can smell rain. Well, that little storm seems to have dissipated.
Debbie, you're in Vancouver and you're wondering about the smaller cats and where they go to kind of shelter themselves. Uh, Debbie, they will go, yes, like you say, possibly into termite mounds, possibly up into trees to seek some kind of solace and refuge. But of course, they're active mostly at night. And I think also under thick bushes, uh, I think there's a lot of that sort of thing that goes on. So rather than, they don't, they're not diggers, cats. So they might go into a shallow termite mound depression. I don't think they'd go as far as going into a burrow. Well, not very often anyway. What are you? Ah. <laughs> That's a water buck. There we go. Well spotted, Viam. Two or three waterbuck bulls. Now, when I got here about almost a year ago, we used to see these things all the time. And I feel like I feel like that we haven't seen them much of late. And Mia in Illinois, Mia Micah. While we look at a fairly drab antelope, but with most impressive horns. The symbol of the Sabi Sands. You want to know about flashing insects? Do we get flashing insects like fireflies? We get fireflies, yes. We get uh, fireflies and glowworms. And a glowworm, of course, is the, um, the number of different species, but the glowworm is often the female version of a firefly, and they attract each other with that incredible light. And very few of them this year, unfortunately, because, again, there wasn't much water, and so they didn't come out. But they're very similar to the fireflies found everywhere else in the world. Well, with the possible exception of the really cold parts of the world. There's an elephant here. Elephant or a hyena, Viam? Okay. Elephant quickly. elephant quickly, everybody, at the dam. If we lose signal, we'll go straight to the hyena den. Rebecca, just keep me posted on whether our signal is getting dodgy or not. in Tampa, you managed to see me going live on Facebook today, uh, which was an embarrassing sort of test of whether it would work or not if our internet connection was strong enough, because we're going to start doing more and more of that stuff. And uh, yes, yes, I did. <laughs> I might try it again after drive. So if you'd like to ask a couple of questions after drive, we can have a live interaction. Well, I mean, a bit like we're doing now. But I might try it again after drive. We'll see if we can find a strong enough internet connection. I'm not sure that it was a treat, Cat, but thank you very much. It was a treat to meet some of the staff, I suppose. There's a lovely herd of elephants drinking at this waterhole. Lake Sydney. There they are. Very peaceful in the sunset. I don't know where the elephants have been. I've missed them for the last little while. About three days, we've had them very scanty around here. And they're all very relaxed having their evening drink. I did see a bull sort of going into that thicket behind them, and I think he'll probably emerge at the water fairly shortly. coming this way. That's good news. They're quite far away. I mean, what, we are about 200 meters away from us at this stage. So that's about 600 feet, just over. Now watch them. We get a lot of questions about elephant behavior and reading elephant behavior. If you look at them carefully now, see how their ears have opened out and they're looking into that thicket. Well, they, look, they are looking into a thicket on the left-hand side of the screen that you can't see. There's the big bull coming now. And look at the size difference. We don't often get that perspective, but look at the size of him compared with the others. And you could see by their open ears that they were worried, they were acknowledging something coming towards them. And they weren't panicked about it, but they weren't exactly filled with a deep sense of joy at that big fella coming towards them now. 
So he is almost certainly looking for a female in estrus. And rather like we were talking about the, <laughs> the impala and the people and how male and female or male humans tend to irritate groups of female humans in the same way that impala do, the same happens with these elephants. where the males are kind of tolerated mainly because, I don't know, well, I mean, often they aren't tolerated. They're tossed out unless they're really big and they cause something of a stink. Let's just stop over here and we'll get them coming across the road. I'm amazed we still have signal. That's very good news. We'll just roll forward here. I think they're going to come out just in front of us. There they are. We still got us, Rebecca. There we go. Here they come. She's just looking at us, saying hi. That's probably the matriarch of the herd. She's leading the youngsters across. They won't all be hers. You can see she's the biggest cow. Definitely the oldest. That's Asabi Sands Gate in the background, if you're wondering. Some very little ones coming across. They won't like the wind. There's another largish cow. The little ones running across the road. I'm sure they've been told to do so. And here comes the behemoth. Uh, where? No, that's not him. It's another littleish one coming. And I wonder if the big fellow won't turn around and go back and have a drink because he came all the way from here. I suspect he's been following them. Here he comes. No, that's still not him. It's another one. They all just give us a little look as they go across. Sneak forward, see if we can't get a sight of the big one, or he may well have gone back down to the water to have a drink. Yeah, he has. Look, okay, there he goes. He's given up. Ladies don't want to talk to him. He's going to have to go and hang out at the bar on his own. Bad luck, old fella. Better luck next time. We're not going to hang around with him. Let's try and go to the hyena den quickly before it gets dark. We won't go backwards the whole way to the hyena den. Just the top here. Oh, Ryan. <laughs> Ryan in Ohio would like to know what the favorite part of my job is. Well, I mean, my job is a fairly simple job description, and that's to take drives in a really beautiful area and talk to people about it. And I mean, there's uh, all parts of that are great fun at the moment. I really enjoy the, I mean, I love living in a, in a beautiful place. I'm really lucky to live in a stunning place. I enjoy the fact that this is a kind of performance job where um, I get to talk to a camera and feel like a star every so often. Uh, really well a little bit really and so that's really nice and I really enjoy the difference between this and say being a standard issue safari guide is that I get to talk to so many of you and that means that the level of discussion that we have is normally excellent we have lots of different discussions about lots and lots of different things which we wouldn't get if we were on a safari vehicle with just six people as opposed to you know a couple of thousand as Hayden Turner used to say, the world's biggest safari vehicle. I think it was Hayden that said that. And that's exactly what's going on. So there's so many parts of it. I really enjoy the media side of it as well. I like this kind of um, the idea that this is a completely live thing, that it's not edited, that we can, of course, just like on a normal safari, find anything around it the next corner. But also, 
that it's uh, we're interacting with you in real time around the world and in high definition i think it's just remarkable the whole being involved with this whole thing has just been a real privilege and of course that privilege is made doubly good by talking to people from all over the world about a part of the world that i love very much and that they also very clearly love too There is a little link road across to Aubrey's Road here that I need to find. Here it is. Aubrey's Road is where the hyenas are. It's very windy now, Vi, and we need to get into some shelter. Here we go, we're getting close now. Not sure what the update is on old Samwise. We'll find out soon enough. <laughs> He's still man down and apparently they're working on the problem. Our old pal Sam and his elephant. Yay, yay, yay. Why they're at this tiny little den? It's going to ease in here. And we'll see who's here. Hi, guys. Why did you move without telling me that you were going to move? the wind starting to blow I think that's old madam isn't it yep so these are the January cubs now like I was saying of course we've seen those little three-month-old leopard cubs and the wind is quite something and they are born slightly differently most most of the cubs born to carnivores or youngsters born to carnivores are born very altricial, which means that they're helpless, they're often blind with their eyes shut, they often can't hear anything, and that sort of their senses develop as they, within the first couple of weeks. Now a hyena is slightly different in that when it's born it has teeth and it is capable of biting and digging almost immediately. is an advantage if you want to kill your siblings uh, it's quite a good idea there's another January cub sticking its head out slightly more nervous than the other ones you can see that this den is I don't know if you can see but it is about half the size of the other one why that one's so nervous Did it come out They are so sweet. And I think they probably habituate to the vehicles even faster than a leopard cub does. They're just a lot more confident. They will grow up into a clan knowing that they basically have others to, to back them, watching their backs to support them. And of course a leopard must learn very early on that it's on its own. Then in the distance there, I think that's, I'm pretty sure that's the matriarch. And in the distance, who do you think that is? It's probably pretty and November. I think that's correct. Now November will be coming to the end of her suckling time. Well, not quite yet, I suppose. November, December, January, February, March, April. Yeah, almost six months old now.
They may have moved out, you know, because of a lack of or you know, not needing the bigger den. June has probably moved on. She's probably moving with the clan now. He is probably moving with the clan. But there's still at least three generations who will still require some form of parental care. Now, that, if you can hear that squealing, then... That's the little one there coming out now. <laughs> So cross. Uh, Book Diva, you surprised that um, hyenas practice simplicide. You haven't, you probably haven't heard that before. Well, yeah, it is surprising. Um, it doesn't always happen. Often if they're two female cubs, one will kill the other. Especially if they're born to a high-ranking female like the matriarch. And I think, I'm not entirely sure, but I, I think that these two chaps here that we're looking at are two males. I, that was the impression that I had. Uh, I've sort of had a look at both of their genitalia. It's not very easy with hyenas, of course, because they all have male genitalia. But you can tell by the shape of the pseudo penis or penis, depending on which is which. And I think these are two males. I might be wrong. And that will be one of the reasons that there hasn't been any siblicide, even though they are born to the matriarch. Um, and Book TV, you want to know if there are any other mammals that might do this? Um, I don't know of any other mammals that do it. There are many, many eagle species that do it. So the black eagle, for example, is the most famous example. The black or Varose eagle is there. They lay two chicks, and one, the first chick to be hatched, will definitely almost, well, almost always kill the second chick. And it's quite common with birds, especially birds of prey. And it's... Bella, the bush baby, you make a very good point. Of course, we've been talking a little bit about the genitalia of the spotted hyena, and you say it's only the spotted hyena that has that genitalia, not the brown hyena uh, or the striped hyena. Yes, you're quite correct. Only the spotted hyena has this amazing social structure of the female-dominated clan, where the females are larger and more dominant over all the males. Only the spotted hyena has that situation where the females have got the pseudo penis, which looks like a, a, a male penis, but isn't. It's an enlarged clitoris. And yeah, only the spotted has that. The others don't. The others are all are all pretty sort of uh, normal. One hesitates to use the term normal, but I suppose in this case, uh, more standard issue mammal genitalia, if you like. I think they must be very pleased that the Birmingham boys are not around here at the moment. They were, they came right through this area the other day, and I think that's why we struggled to find them for a few days. They seem to be out and about now. And maybe also, you know, I used to, I've come up, I've sort of driven past this den. You can see the den from the road. But maybe if you don't drive into it. Oh, that's interesting. Who's this? This must be one of the D's. D1 or D2. And the matriarch is always tolerant of them when they come and say hello. Well, relatively. <laughs> She's relatively tolerant of them. That's a very nice question from Jilly all the way from York. In the north country. Um, Julie, you say hyenas hunt as a clan or as a pack, and do they ever share their kills? Uh, the answer is, uh, well, they have to if it's a big animal, but they fight horribly over their kills, and it's one of the leading causes of injury, actually. Hyenas within a clan will injure each other. 
with fighting around kills. Now the very obvious little white patch on the back hind foot of D1, the, one of the December cubs, which is, this is the other one now, seems to have disappeared. And that means that they're quite difficult to tell apart now. In fact, they're impossible to tell apart. Just looking at the back hind foot there, just to see if the, if the underside of the foot isn't pink. I thought one was male and one was female. I might be wrong again. There, I can see a little patch of white, you know. That's D1. That hyena you're looking at there behind the tree is D1. There's a little patch of white on the back hind foot, and I still think she's a female. From the look of her pseudo penis there, which is not pinched at the end, it's pretty straight. I think she's a, that's a female. And we should, I suppose, now start to be able to see a slight size difference. Um, you know, she's, well, what are they now? They're almost five or six, five months old. Almost five months old. So they should start, if the other one is a male, like I suspect, she will start to get slightly bigger than her brother. got up there, and the other D, D twin is up, that's it, and it seems to be looking into the bush here. I think that's the little male. It would be very helpful if his sister would stand up next to him so we can see if they're different sizes. Now, I was just mentioning the other day, I thought how you know, we have been incredibly lucky with these hyenas. They've given us a profound amount of joy. But at the same time, um, the, the clan at Arethusa, in fact, it's on Simbambilia, I think, it, which, and it'll use Arethusa a lot. There are 50 adult hyenas in that clan, as opposed to the 16 or 17 identifiable adults in this clan. So it is massive. Tony, I don't think, what, um, I mean, your question is a valid one. Do hyenas ever kill their own young and eat them in hard times? Uh, not by default, no. I think, you know, I, do, I think what would happen is that the cubs would eventually starve to death. Would they then be eaten by their parents? Yeah, quite possibly. Yeah, I think it's definitely possible. Interestingly, hyenas that are killed by other predators are seldom eaten. So if a lion kills a hyena, it will seldom eat it. They will often just leave them. Where, as I mean, I've seen lions eating other lions quite readily, and I've seen lions eating their brother, a bit a coalition of four, like the Birmingham boys are now. One of them died, and he was eaten by his brothers, which was quite interesting. I don't think that they would ever take the time to kill a youngster and then eat it because they were feeling hungry. Because I'm sure that they do go through times of extreme hunger. And I think where that instinct not to be sort of suppressed, I think that you'd find the number of hyena around in the area would be substantially less than they are now. Now, we're not going to sit here for too much longer because it's starting to get a little bit dark, but let's enjoy them for another five minutes or so, and then we'll drive off with the lights blazing and see what creatures of the night we can find. You'll notice not a lot of birdsong around at the moment. <laughs> and we have had a tweet from Sam Shev on Twitter. Uh, that, in case you don't know, is a Samuel Samwise Gamgee Chevalier. He says they've had a technical glitch on Rusty because we took his elephant. 
I didn't take his elephant. His elephant decided to come with us, didn't it, Viam? Yes. It wanted to see some leopards, didn't it? It was in the car. It was in the car. There it is. I have not removed it at all. I've given it the odd prod. He seems fairly well set. I've stroked him to make him feel happy. There we are. Sam, we're looking after your elephant, I promise. If you could fix your car, that would be great, because, of course, looking at the night sky with your camera will be better than looking at the night sky with this one, except that the night sky is probably going to be a blanket of scudding clouds. You can just see the last little bits of pink there in the clouds behind. But the sun is now set. Jared, a brilliant question from you about male hyenas, and could they or could they not be parts of two different clans? Again, Jared, I'd hate to say no, impossible. I'd say highly unlikely. Would I say it's never happened before? No, I wouldn't say that, because I think what would happen is that a male from this clan, for example, would probably move off to a neighboring clan or maybe a clan too, too along from here. It's the males that disperse. The females stay within the natal clan. Um, but, of course, when they emigrate, they lose all their status. So even a high-born male in this clan would move on to another clan and become basically, uh, what are they called? He'd become a, a serf in that clan. He'd be a very low-ranking male indeed. And so would he then come back to his natal clan every so often? Yeah, I don't see why he wouldn't. But he wouldn't be part of that clan, no. Uh, would they try and kill him? No, I don't think they would. I think they'd probably... Uh, greet him relatively fondly, especially the other males in the clan. Um, but that's an interesting one. I don't know for sure whether that would be possible or not. I think the males probably disperse quite a long way from here. If they don't go to the next door clan, then it's unlikely they'll belong to more than one. Uh, I think, I'm not sure, you know, it's like a gang situation here. I'm not sure if you're allowed to belong to two gangs or not. I'm not sure how the law works. Ah, here comes Corky. I think it is mangled ear and all. It might not be. That is Corky. That's Corky, the mother of the two December cubs. doing there though this is interesting let's just watch what happens here pretty sure that's corky i saw those scars on the top of her head between her ears and that one sort of nastily bitten ear she's a big female that she's tall she's lean she's in her prime well she's going off into the night we're going to pull out of here now it's starting to get a bit dark and blustery while we do that, I believe that uh, Monsieur Chevalier is back on his vehicle. His technical problems are over. His elephant has sent him good vibes. Let's go and find out what he's going to do. We are back on live TV. We had a few technical problems a bit earlier. We weren't sure what was going on. We were sitting with that large herd of buffaloes. And next thing we knew, the camera just wasn't working. What did, what did it say, Brian? Uh, reinsert AC connector. Reinsert AC connector. <laughs> so we went back and Eugene and Connor, who are just the wizards behind the technical details here at Juma, just figured it all out for us. So it's got nothing to do with that elephant, that bad luck, because, you know, James didn't actually take my elephant. I left it on the vehicle that I used yesterday. But have a look at these big buffalo bulls that we're seeing over here. They're all sitting quite nicely underneath the tree. Well, the curious one would like to know, do the guides flip a coin in order to see which vehicle they will go out in the morning? Well, Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Curious One, 
it's actually dependent on, on who wants to drive to Cheetah Plains, who wants to go to Arethusa, and who wants to be on Juma, because Rusty over here is our Cheetah Plains and our Arethusa expert. So we just switch and change every single day, but sometimes we'll flip a coin. I know that Jamie and James sometimes do that. So at the moment it hasn't quite got there, but let's just take a look at this buffalo that's right underneath the bushes over here. Look at him, he's hiding. You know, I think he knows the rain's coming, so he's getting into a nice position so that when it rains, he can look at his friends and say, I chose the best spot to do nothing at. Ha. <laughs> so we've been with a huge buffalo herd today already, and now we're just sitting with some big dagger boys. But not only are we out uh, tracking all sorts of things, we need to find Brian's pillow. Ooh, here we go. This buffalo's just got up. I think he's also quite enjoyed the idea of his friend underneath the bush. Maybe he'll get up. Yes, he is. He? That was such a great call. No, no, that's my spot, he says. Okay. <laughs> I think, he, I think he's going to go and see if he can find his own little bit of cover. Well, with that, we've seen the buffaloes sitting here, and now we are going to move away. I didn't mean to get in your way there. I was, just wanted to tell you that we're going to go and see if we can find Brian's pillow, because Brian's pillow fell off the back of the vehicle just after we found out that we had some technical well, problems. So we don't know. Maybe a leopard is lying on top of his pillow. Maybe something has come and destroyed its little pieces. We don't, oh, there it is, <laughs> tracked. The track and find right there. We found Brian's pillow in the drainage line. And luckily there is no leopard on top of it, which is what I thought might happen. Just gonna go and get it. Look at it sitting over there. Nothing was quite interested in your in your pillow, Brian. Yeah. Have you showed everyone your your thumb today, Brian? Yeah. Show everyone your thumb. It's a balloon, and it surely is a windy day today. So his balloon might just fly away from his thumb. Who knows? Brian really needs this thing. It looks after his bum on the seat. I don't know what else you use it there for, Brian. Uh, mostly my bum. <laughs> Just for the bum. <laughs> All right, so the tracking team found a pillow. And now we're going to get back out there and hopefully find something cool. So we're going over the Juma Dam wall now. I'm going to switch on my lights because it's got quite dark quite quickly and it definitely has got a little bit cooler. I heard you were with the hyenas with James. That must have been great fun. James on the touch field, well, touch rugby we played today, was running everywhere. Kathy in Florida was saying, Sam, did you say you worked for a leopard place before this? Yes, Kathy from Florida. I worked just in the northern parts of Cape Town, the mountain range there, which is called the Cedarburg. And I worked for a conservation trust called the Cape Leopard Trust. I was working as, you know, in, as a, a guide, environmental educator for some of the young children that were coming through. So children, children from townships in Cape Town to schools in Cape Town were coming through to the Cedarburg and I was taking them tracking, I was taking them to see like all types of stuff and skulls, we would go look for skulls and we would go look for baboons because there's loads of baboons there. So, and of course we would go look for the infamous Cape Leopard but the Cape Leopard, very very different to the leopard that we get here in the savannah. It's half the size and it, and it will have a territory that is maybe sometimes 10 times the size of a leopard that is here. So to find a leopard out in that mountain range was exceptionally hard 
I never ever actually found one. I was only there four to five months. But in a strange way, I'm, I'm very grateful for not finding one, just because it's, it's going to push me to want to go back there and see if I can find a Cape Leopard one day. The elusive Cape Leopard, it's shy, it's scared, and it's been, it's quite in a vulnerable position because there's a number of farms over there. I think I can see a little steenbok. Oh, it just ran, ran away from us, out into the distance. But yeah, so the, the conservation of those leopards, the Cape Leopard, is really, really important because we are losing them. And the biggest thing that we don't realize is that you will, they, we're losing them because you know, farmers are killing them because they kill all their livestock. And of course, I get that, you know, if that's your profits, you know, and your profits getting eaten by a leopard. It's a problem. So the Cape Leopard Trust has been trying to develop strategies around trying to conserve the beautiful Cape Leopard. And it's very difficult. They've come up with a number of strategies and, and ways and to do so. They've, one of them is introducing an Amatolian sheepdog into a flock of sheep, and that will protect the sheep from the Cape Leopard that comes through. But what I also wanted to mention is that the Cape Leopard is very important for that ecosystem. Why is it very important? Because it will regulate the species that are beneath it, like the Dussies. I don't know if you know the Dussie populations. They are very, very similar. They're actually quite the same family as, as elephants, which is quite, quite funny because they don't look anything the same. I mean, a Dussie is probably about this big. But you get Dussies then, you get clip springers, which are antelope that like to jump on rocks around the Cedarberg. And that, the leopard is the only one that will go and kill those species, as well as the black eagle. But if you kill off all the Cape Leopards, the, the Clip Springer and the Dussie populations will overpopulate and the carrying capacity will then destroy the habitat of that area. There's no leopard to regulate that area. So what potentially could happen in the future is that all the grass becomes dilapidated or destroyed and it turns into a desert area where there won't be any, any room for any biodiversity there. So we have to understand that predators play a crucial role in the conservation of landscapes. All predators, your cougars in America, to the, to the leopard that walks this land, is all crucial in terms of allowing biodiversity to thrive in this area. Brian Martin, I'm so glad you watched my video. It's been a great day for me purely because that is the last project I did before starting this job at Safari Live. Um, I put a lot of effort into it and it's incredible to have, I ran from Joburg to Cape Town to try and raise money with a whole bunch with an organization called MAD, Make a Difference Foundation. And we met up with my brother's organization which is Plant the Seed. We've got an antelope just in the front there. I'm just going to switch on the light because, oh, see, it doesn't like that light. I don't want to shine the lights as it gets darker now. I'm just going to keep my lights off and drive a little bit forward. <laughs> I just switched off my vehicle. <laughs> but as I, was, as I was saying, the Cape Leopard, well, not the Cape Leopard, just the Make, Make a Difference Foundation and Plant the Seed, which is an education-based um, entrepreneuring thing that my brothers put together to try and develop a new strategies towards education. And we ran through a, a town called Ceres. We planted a food garden with all my, well, a lot of my best mates in a community that we would never spend time at. We got to learn a little bit more about the local community that's there. And we got to spend time putting our hands in the soil. So I'm really glad that you enjoyed that video. It, it means a lot to me. And it's definitely the proudest thing that I am, you know, the, the best thing I've ever done in my life is that video. So thank you for watching that. Safari Dean is, <laughs> is asking if I roughed up a Smeagol in our rugby game today. You know, I don't know if you're referring to Smeagol as James. If you are, that's quite hilarious. Um, but no, myself, Brian, and James, and Dave, 
Yeah, okay, so I just got confirmation that you are calling Smeagol James. That's hilarious. <laughs> Sorry about that, James. It's a bleak one. But Brian, myself, and Dave, and James were part of the same team. So we were on the same team. We weren't playing against each other. So we actually won the game, and we played, I think, really, really well. It was amazing to see how Brian is on that field. Brian was, had a great pass, Dave was running good lines, and James has an incredible pass. And I'm not sure what I did, but I was just on the field doing my best. <laughs> but more importantly, let's see what species we might be able to find out here in the evening. I just want to see if I can find my light. Once I find my light, we can do all sorts of things out here. Just while I find my light, which is beneath all the, the amount of things that I have here, from bird books to everything else, we can go and see what Smeagol, oh sorry, James is up to. Now, Smeagol, of course, was a toothless, well, gap-toothed, bald, yes I'm bald, um, long-limbed, I'm certainly not long-limbed person, who was not very nice. Now, Sam, here's a lighter, and uh, there's your wooden elephant. Now, do not, I'm threatening your wooden elephant now, do not call me such an insulting thing again. I'm not to be trifled with. On we go. I wouldn't really burn it, everyone, I promise. Smeagol would, though. <laughs> We've come down Bivol's of cut line here. We hoped to find Gajima the leopard, because this is where Viam said he would be. Viam has failed to deliver on that promise, uh, and so is the leopard. We did find one male impala shouting into Bivol's hook, and perhaps he had seen a leopard, but he was with a whole herd of females who were disinterested, so I think he was just doing his rutting thing. Then, the other thing to tell you is that the dogs, I think probably the Investec pack that's been in Manileti, are now on Biffle's Hook. So, with any luck, they will be doing their morning breakfast hunt on quarantine clearings as we go live tomorrow morning. Whether or not that will be the case, I don't know, but it would be very nice indeed. Annie in British Columbia, you are concerned, as are so many, with the fate of our old mate Junior, and you say with Scrapper now uh, moved on to better things, having shaken off this mortal coil. Uh, would the remaining four Birminghams be more uh, sort of likely to accept Junior into their ranks? Absolutely not. Annie, uh, I think it's highly unlikely. I mean, I think it's so highly unlikely, I'd almost be willing to say definitely not. But in biology, that can get you egg on your face. They don't need him. They don't need Junior. They are older than him. They are dominant now in this area. They don't need Junior to be here. And we don't want Junior to be here. And we don't want him to be here because it's good for lion dynamics. It's good for their genetics when the males move away and go and find their own prides and sort, out, sort themselves out in different areas from where they were born. And that's very important. Just on there, there's some elephants, which I'm not going to shine on. I'm just going to tell you that they're there, looking a little nervous in the wind. Um, just to say, we got an interesting email, and I forget who it was from, because I think I've been saying that the sky bed males, nine of them, uh, well, there were nine, were young males sort of looking to take a territory. And we got an email the other day that said that I'm talking absolute nonsense, and that they are at least, I said it was highly unlikely that that coalition would ever last. And apparently it is split up into three and six, if I'm not mistaken. And if you wouldn't mind sending through this information again, that would be great. But that they are now about six years old, if I'm not mistaken, and that they are dominant. 
So thank you very much for pointing out my error. And I'm sorry I've forgotten your name. It's not you, no, nothing to do with you, everything to do with my inability to remember names. But thank you very much for that information. So, as I was saying, you say, you say things in biology and normally they then proved to be absolute nonsense. I said a coalition of nine would never survive. I didn't think a coalition larger than four would ever survive. And it would seem that I am completely wrong. That up in the northern Manileti, the skybed males are dominant. Nine of them, six and three, they seem to have split into. I think that was the email. So thank you very much for that information. And of course we were talking to Ryan earlier about the joys of this job. And one of the joys of jo this job is that we get that some, we get that wonderful information from our viewers. And that was Crystal in California. Thank you very much, Crystal. And any further information you have on them would be wonderful. It's always slightly embarrassing when somebody from California knows more about the lions in your area than you do. Um, yes, and we'll try and remedy that situation as time goes on. Very windy night, unlikely that we're going to see many creatures of the night. So if you've got any questions about Africa in general, particularly perhaps you want to know about some of the lesser known bits of it. Many people have seen documentaries about the famous animals we get here and we're streaming across the plains of the Serengeti in Kenya and the gorillas of course of the Central African rainforests and then the South African Zambian or Southern African wonderlands of wildlife that we have. If you have any other questions send them through to us they don't have to be related to anything we're looking at now. Diva and many others, why are you fascinated about whether I smoke or not? It's a very interesting question. Uh, I do not smoke. I have never actually smoked a cigarette in all my days. All my 40 years, I've never smoked a cigarette. I think I took a puff once when I was about 32 and found it so deeply offensive uh, that I didn't try it again. So no, I'm not a smoker. Um, I'm not sure why you were worried about that particular question? I'd love to know. No, I'm not a smoker. Oh, I see, no. No, no, this was Viam's lighter. Viam is also not a smoker, but Viam is prepared for every eventuality. He is a great camper and outdoorsman, which means he... Oh, look, 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 look. Oh, James, you idiot. Oh, I can't believe it. There was a spotted eagle owl, a huge owl, sitting on this post. And I was blithering away. I didn't see it. I'm so sorry, everyone. Let's just ease our way through here. There it is. Is that, is that a post? Did you get him, Vim? No. Now, apparently, no. we have... We have a slow-mo of the owl. Let's go and have a look at it. This is wonderful. We can do an action replay live. Here it, here it comes. very nice. I'm most impressed that we were able to do that. That's brilliant. Unfortunately, I think that owl, which I think was a spotted eagle owl from the brief glimpse I got, is now absconded. <coughs> Watch out, Vian. This tree has been pushed slightly by elephants. Anyway, yes, Vian is always prepared for every eventuality. Torch, knife, lighter, matches. What else have we got, Vian? Food. We've always got a large uh, picnic. <coughs> what else? Uh, what? Water. And of course the great friend of the cameraman is the cable tie. And the 
great enemy of the cameraman is the cable tie that has been cut and not burned at the ends. This will slice you open. And I have used that very lighter to sort that problem out on a number of occasions. You will see that Sam's elephant is still fine. And Shoe, shoe Pat or Shoe Ka, I can't hear exactly. Uh, you say that owl was so large, very big, about two and a half feet tall. Two and a half feet tall, the spotted eagle owl. Just slightly smaller than the one we were chatting about with the school kids earlier today, the giant eagle owl. Anyway, we're going to pull past Wilfelsburg Dam briefly. I haven't been there today, so we're going to see what's happening there quickly before we start making our way home to camp. Let's head across to Samuel and find out what's going on on his end of... <laughs> Never mind. Let's just go to Sam. So we are driving slowly through this thicket. We just saw two bush babies jumping around next to us. First time I've seen a, like a, a bush baby close up, but they we were just gone within a matter of seconds. So we're just looking to see if we can find any of them again. I heard that you had a spotted eagle owl that flew across your screen with James. That must have been very cool. Very special to see a spotted eagle owl. I also wanted to see if we can see a chameleon. It's not easy to see a chameleon, especially in this weather. You know, the weather is, changes the environment a lot. So just to give you a little bit of a feeling of what, I'm, what we're experiencing. So you can see I've got my beanie on, so it's slightly chilly. Um, but the, the clouds before we went, we went back onto our vehicle got really, really thick. And so the winds picked up and the clouds have picked up and that changes a lot out here in the bush. As we saw with the buffalo just now, the buffalo was hiding underneath that tree. So you can see the animals are feeling a little bit more frightened, a little bit more scared than usual. Because this is going to make conditions a little bit different for them out here. So you've got to be extra quiet, you've got to be extra aware of those eyes that might be looking in your direction. And it's a quick flicker that you'll see. Those eyes, those little bright eyes will look at you and, you and then that's it. So that's what the bush babies look like. They're just jumping from tree to tree and you can just see those eyes look at you and then jump to the next tree and ooh, got some antelope over here. I'm just going to switch off. I think it looks like some kudu, but I know that it's not very nice for them to have bright lights around them. So I'm just going to switch off for a second. Can you actually try it? Would you be able to see those reflective lights, Brian, or is that way too dark? It's way too dark. It's way too dark. You're not going to be able to see that. But it's quite interesting when you drive through the bush at night time because you can see the different animals that have a different type of reflective in their eyes. And, and the antelope has the reflection of a, like a significant white that comes out. So that's how you know it's, a, it's an antelope. But when it's a predator, those eyes are, are quite a, a dark red, and you can tell that straight away when you see a predator. So at the moment, what I'm seeing is a few antelope that are in the bushes here. They're very aware of us because they know that they've seen that we've stopped the vehicle. So they've just got their ears out like that. And I'm going to switch on the car. We go very slowly next to them. I don't want to give them too much of a fright. I know they're already feeling quite scared. Go. See you later, my friends. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Good luck in this. Oh, there they go. Listen to that. Okay. We can go back to our search. We can just see. Have, have a look at this tree that's that's come out over here. This is a dead knob thorn over here, and just behind that are two stars that have just come out. So you'll barely see them. It's a quick little twinkle out there. 
But I think that that is the pointer stars for the Southern Cross. And that star that is quite bright at the moment is, I think it is Alpha Centauri. Yes, Alpha Centauri and Beta Centauri. So Alpha and Beta Centauri are the two pointer stars of the Southern Cross. And Alpha Centauri is our closest star to Earth. So other than the Sun, Alpha Centauri is our closest star, which is about 4.3 light years away. And a light year is the amount of time taken for light to travel in a vacuum. So that light that we're seeing right now from that star took 4.3 years to get to us. How incredible is that to think about distance? And if we wanted to fly there in a rocket to Alpha Centauri, it would take 25,000 years to get to our closest star. Which, I mean, just for a second, just try and think about how big that universe is when you think about how close our st the closest star is to our planet. And if I put my thumb up, I'm just going to put, I'm just going to put my, my thumb just like that in, next to it. Can you, I want to see if I can get into that frame. If we zoom out a little bit, we'll be able to see my thumb just for a second, just so that we can see something in terms of the amount of galaxies that are out there. And if I put my thumb there, sorry, it's very dark and I can't see much. So that's my thumb. If I put my thumb out there and put it in towards the universe, the place where my nail is, in that nail, if, you, if I hold it up to the sky, could be up to 10 thousand galaxies so we part of one galaxy which is the Milky Way and if I hold my thumb up there into the universe we can have up to 10,000 galaxies that we know of so I just thought I'd just put a little bit of perspective about stars and all the interesting things that is out there and while we drive through here let's go and see what Mr. James Henry is doing We just saw a civet go through there, everybody, but it just scuttled across the road much too fast for us to kind of link and see it at the same time. Anyway, Vim did record it, so if you are doubting us, he will post it, I'm sure. Anyway, civet. I've only seen two, and we find their tracks all over the road all the time, and yet we don't see them very often at all. That was the second one I've seen. We might lose you through this drainage line here, so I apologize if that happens. So we'll just get Sam on standby. Scuffled across the road. Ooh, we're coming back. And so you are back with us. Who knows what's going on with Mr. James? Maybe he's joining the Fellowship of the Ring and trying to get to Mordor. Ourselves, we are going through quite a thick block here. So it's not very easy. And this block, these two things which you can't see at the moment are two big holes that Buffalo have made. So we're just trying to get around that and as soon as I've done that, we can start looking for everything else that is out there. If you have any questions about stars or about galaxies, please hashtag Safari Live. Let us know what you know about nebulas, about red stars, about red giants. I'm fascinated by the stars and really, really interested by them. And you know, my interest in stars started when I was out in Cedarburg Mountains and I was reading a lot of books by Lawrence van der Post. And he used to say that the Bushmen had a relationship to the natural world so strong that they saw stars as part of their lives. And I just think that's so cool because I don't have a relationship with the stars as, as what I would like. So I really want to develop that. So the more that I can grow that through you, the better that will be, I don't know, for both of us. But James is back in action. Let's go and see what he's doing.
James is not back in action. <laughs> He's still with Brian and Sam. And Brian Stum, the balloon, who's still going very well. He hasn't flown away. And we're just looking to see if we can find any critters of the night. Sean from Secunda is asking me how many moons does Jupiter have? Sean, I think it's around 67 moons that we have. And I know, well, I've read in a paper that one of Jupiter's moons, you know, they're all very different in terms of its molecular makeup. And one of the moons actually made out of ice, which is incredible, water. So it's fascinating to know that there is some water out in that massive, massive universe. I definitely wanted to be an astronaut when I was a young boy. But science, I needed to do very well in both maths and science. And I mean, I did okay. Didn't do badly, but I needed to get A's. We've seen something, hold on. We've just seen a bush baby. I'm not quite sure what we've seen yet. Oh, it's a, it's a chame... Wow! Brian has the eyes of some other creature I have never met before, but he has just spotted a chameleon. And this is the flat neck chameleon. This is the second one that I've seen since I've been here. It's incredible that he has managed to see that because that almost looks like a leaf, don't you think? I mean, you could easily mistaken that for a leaf. Wow, well done. So they'll be sitting out on those leaves and obviously it gives them that protection because they can look like that. But they're able to push their tongues out and collect any food for the evening. How often have you guys seen a chameleon out on night drive with Safari Live. So this is my very, very first one. And it's so cool to watch their eyes because they can both, they can turn their eyes in two different directions. So one, di one eye can be looking at us, the other eye could be looking behind them, which gives them such good you know, protection because they can look in all directions from for predators. So any predator that is coming from above or below can be looked at in two different directions. And I tell you, I would struggle doing that. I would never be able to do that with two eyes. And I mean, even from a biomimicry point of view, we've learned so much from the chameleon. Just in terms of the way in which you can camouflage. There's now a science that's being put into, into technology that is able to you know, create camouflage and make products that can actually mimic their environment. It's fascinating when, when we stop and look at all these different designs and, and the way in which different animals live in the natural world and learn from them. So that's our first sighting, the flap-necked chameleon. Well done, Brian. Awesome spot. Well, we are going to carry on down this road and see maybe we can find another flat neck chameleon. I wouldn't be surprised if Brian does it again. We had a question now around someone asking, you know, if, um, if I... Lael, yeah, it was Lael. Is it because of my family background that I would be able to operate a camera? Lael, you know, my dad is, of course, he's a film, filmmaker, film producer, and he 
he has taught me a few things in the past about how to to work with camera angles and and, and all those little things. Sorry, I just drove over something. I thought it was above us. So my dad has taught me a few things and I've learned a little bit from them over the years, but I never studied film and photography. I've got my own camera, which is a D7 Canon, and I really enjoy doing it. And my, I have a really good friend, his name is Justin Woods, and he's amazing at filming. And him and I, for the last three years, have been going out and filming different things, different projects. So all the films that you've seen, from Mad to Run to the organic farming that we did has been done by friends, like a collection of friends that have worked together to build those videos. So I definitely have a passion for photography and videography. So we've had a fantastic day. We had a bit of a technical problem, but that at least was managed to be sorted out. We didn't have Mr. Ellie to help us and direct our way around the bush, but it's been fantastic and I'll be out tomorrow for the sunset safari and we'll see what we can find. With that, thank you Brian behind camera, you've been great, your eyes are incredible and we will see you all tomorrow. Cheers for now. We are now coming across the Juma Dam. Now what we're going to do everybody, we did actually catch that civet. And the brilliance of the final control consisting of Rebecca and Kirsten who are able to show you a slow-mo of the scuttling civet going across the road. So here, in the next two seconds, it is. Now, that civet, <laughs> excuse me everybody, is an interesting one because it does leave a very smelly scent around the place. It's got very powerful anal glands. And those anal glands, interestingly, are what has, what has caused its demise in many parts of the world. The anal glands are used as a perfume fixative. And so when, for lots of the perfumes, made by all the big brands of perfume makers around the world. I don't know if they still, I think they still use it. I think they still use the extract of the, of the, um, of the anal gland there for, as a perfume fixative. I'm just going to shut the lights down. There's a herd of impala running like startled deer into the lights. Uh, I know that it's ridiculously dark, but I just don't want to freak these little chaps out. Go on, cross the road, lots of them, big herd here. And then just like I know many of you will know about how deer become totally freaked out by lights and they get stunned by them and they run towards the cars. And you can't see right now, but the whole herd is kind of jogging up the road in front of us. I'll just flash, that, flash them for you. There they go. And we'll just very gently drive behind them without making them too upset. So that was a civet, everyone, and I don't think we've seen one live before. I've seen only one here, and I'm, I mean, I've no doubt many of you have seen them live before, but I hadn't seen one. So that was very exciting. Wasn't it, Viam? Yes. Were you overwhelmed? No. Yes. I like civets. There we go. Viam likes civets. And with yesterday, we also had a brief glimpse, but also not live, of its relative, the genet. They're quite closely related to each other. And we'd see lots of them. Like I say to you quite often, the, and we were comparing their tracks today, actually, with the tracks of those little leopards, trying to compare the difference. And the little leopard obviously has a much bigger track these days. And I was, I was astounded by the size of that leopard cub's track. Fully an inch across already. Sorry, we'll get onto quarantine now. We'll be able to turn some lights on. But these impala are behaving like raging lunatics. They're now just running across the road there. Why is anyone's guess? You are being silly. There we go. It's interesting. Eric in Virginia Beach says that the great horned owl of the United States is likely to attack 
uh, osprey at night. And do the owl, are big owls do that? No, I don't think they do. I've never heard of a, a big owl here killing a bird of prey. I'm sure it has happened from time to time. But no, I've not heard of that happening. An osprey is a pretty large bird for an owl to be killing. That's fascinating. Thank you, Eric. Well, we're on quarantine clearings now. More impala are around. Oh, that's very nice. Marilyn, Montana. You reckon that the spotted eagle owl and the dusky flycatcher were two new birds for many people's bird lists. That's brilliant. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. We don't often see them. Interestingly, that dusky flycatcher, we had one in camp earlier today that Sam identified and he was chasing it around the place. It was extremely confiding. It let us get to within sort of three or four feet of it. So, yes, it could well possibly be. And maybe they've moved into this area for a little while. And I'm sure the spotted eagle owl, yeah, not very common here. Don't hear them calling often at all. So very nice to see them. A new one for many bird lists. <laughs> and Safari Dean, you say that the final control, <coughs> excuse me, just showing off now with all their slow-mos. Yes, they are liable to show off, aren't they, VM? Kirsten and Rebecca, real show-offs they are. Extremely humble people they are. Well, we've got about four minutes left, everyone. And we'll just sort of circle quarantine for that time. See what we can find here. Let's switch off and have a listen. This tree next to which I'm parking, we heard the Scops owl in yesterday, this one here. The Scops owl was calling from this very tree last night. But I think in the wind, many of them will be pretty quiet now. There's no sound except that of the wind rustling through the trees. And it's really, it's very pleasant. I enjoy it after a hot day. It's a lovely sound, mysterious rustling of the wind in the leaves. No owls, just one lonely stridulating cricket in the background going I'm also surprised consistently by the fact that there is no black-backed jackal pair living on quarantine clearings. I don't know why that should be. I've seen side-striped jackal here before. We saw those black-backed jackals at Cheetah Plains, and I'm sure we'll spend a lot more time with them as time goes on. But I'm always surprised that this clearing would seem to be perfect habitat for jackals. Might be the number of hyena that come through this area. Quarantine is very much a focal point, and <clears throat> I think you'll find that the Hyenas come sort of through here on a foraging mission quite regularly. And maybe, and so do many of the leopards. And so maybe that's why the jackals don't hang around here. Leopard, of course, will readily eat other predators. And they catch jackals quite a lot. And they catch domestic dogs as well. So you must be very careful if you keep a domestic dog in an area like this. See the dust blowing. Oh, look at the dust. See all the dust there? <laughs> yeah, no, it's starting to get winter dusty already, and I must say, I think it's, um, well, it's, it, it's already so dusty, and we've, I mean, we haven't even begun to touch the winter yet. And Mia, my cat, you say thank you for the laughs. Well, it's my absolute pleasure. I'm glad you've had a few laughs. I've had a few laughs too. It's always very amusing to drive with VM. He's a, he's a profoundly, subtly amusing human being. Aren't you, VM? Yeah. There we go, you see? 
just get past these impalas. Have a good night, impalas. I hope that you survive unattacked. But watch out, the wild dogs are coming back tomorrow. Yes, not much going on in the clearing. Well, that's going to be pretty much it from us today, everyone. Thank you for, your, for joining us on our little drive. We've had a wonderful time with Karula and her cubs, just very special indeed. And I'm very glad we got to share that with you and those little kids as well. Thanks, Fiam. Big thanks, of course, to Rebecca and Kirsten in the final control. And, of course, to Sam Wires Gamgee, his elephant, and Brian on the other vehicle. We'll see you tomorrow morning at about, well, not at about, at exactly 6 o'clock. Until then, stay safe and happy wherever you are in the world. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.